morning, everyone. Dear Prime Minister, with great pleasure, I would like to welcome you to this year IEEE Women in Engineering Equality, where there are three challenges and opportunities enabling technologies for connected smart city events. This event is organized by the IEEE Women in Engineering UK and Ireland Affinity Group and hosted by the Industrial Internet of Things Research Group, IOOT. The IEEE Women in Engineering is an initiative to facilitate the recruitment and reduction of women in the technology and discipline globally. We envision a vibrant community of IGTV women and men collectively using their diverse talents to innovate for the benefit of humanity. This is the third annual event conducted by the Air Professional Working Group. The previous events, 2021 and 2022, were held online. This 2023 workshop will be a full day in person event including six technical talks and panel discussion by speakers from industry, academia, and regulators, policy makers. And this event participants will have the opportunity to learn from experts in the field who will, who will share their insight on how technology can be used to support small cities. The event will be introduced the participant to the state of art smart city research, highlighting the challenges and opportunities. This event is a great opportunity for graduate students, early career researchers, and final year students from STEM subject to connect with professionals and start their network, learn about the potential career opportunity, and ask their questions about the the experience required and the career path. I would like to thank our speakers and participants, especially those from the Dusty and Academia who dedicated their time today to engage in this activity. I would like also to thank the Irish uh, United Kingdom Lions, Students Branch representative, and the India Irish Students Branch representative to attend our event. Once again, welcome to this session, and I wish you all a fruitful and engaging session. I would like to introduce my colleague, Muna Jaffer. She is one of our steering committee member. She can talk about the activity we are doing and our work group. So how can I change the slides from there? So, good morning again, everyone. I just want to take five minutes to introduce to you the Irishful e Women in Engineering and the Affinity Group in the UK and Ireland. So, this is headed by Nagam, who just left. And um, um, so, there's 15,000 women in engineering, and our objective in this effort is to promote more women, to include more women in engineering. Not because we think that women are better or different, it's just to have equality and to have inclusivity and to have diversity in the engineering team. We believe that having this diversity and inclusivity produces better engineering. And this is the objective of, of this group. So just to... Um, so these are the committee members um, and uh, we're all based in the UK all around. 
um, some of the activities that we do. So these are just some, some images and you see that we try to promote um, engineers who are studying um, in the UK mostly and from all around in different disciplines, being electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, and um, different things. So this is our objective. Um, just to perhaps give sense some of the ideas, we do the outreach group. So this is where we go to schools and this is where we try to um, trigger the interest of young girls in engineering and try to uh, motivate them to take a uh, path in this area. We do also um, lots of activities with the um, graduate students and undergraduate students. We had an event in Primary last year where it's about the careers, where we explain to students what kind of careers they can have. All of the events that we do, we welcome men and women. It's not just for women. Um, our effort is to have the equality from, from both. And yesterday we had the RCIM um, event as well, and uh, it was in Central London, it was very successful. We had the WCNC event, uh, this was in Glasgow uh, in March, and uh, we had a panel from Leading Women in Engineering, and it was very successful as well. Um, so, some other activities, the early career talks. So, this is where we encourage anybody, anybody in their early career to come and present their research, to come and present their work. And we think this is a very important step to build the confidence of people, again, men and women, um, in their early careers. So, just some of these examples. The awards team, so we all, so every year we make it a point to award uh, leading women in engineering, and this is the awards team um, that, that we have. So we have four different awards that, uh, that, that we select every year. And I think, yeah. So I'm going to stop here and uh, give, yes. So I'm going to uh, let Professor Izzet uh, introduce the IEEE. I think Professor Izzet is the chair of the Region 8 IEEE, and he will uh, talk to us about the IEEE activities. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very much, Mona, for that uh, kind introduction. But I, I would like to just make a correction. I am the chair of uh, the UK and Ireland section. I, can you see my slides? I'm sharing my slides. Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Mona. You've you've gone through your slides like a bullet. Uh, you you the the our women in engineering group in the UK and Ireland section are very active, and there was so much to talk about. Uh, so you can see how active a group you all are, and I credit and praise you all for your activities. It's a great honor for me to make a, a welcome talk, and I'll try and keep to my time slot. I know that you, we started slightly late. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is just to give you a little view of what the, um, the, what the section is all about. I'm the chair of the UK and Ireland section, and uh, I would like to welcome you all to this um, uh, event. Now, we as the UK and Ireland section are the one of the uh, largest sections in the IEEE and for sure within uh, Region 8. Uh, we have more than uh, within IEEE, which is the largest professional organization in the world, has uh, 428,000 plus members. We like to say around half a million members, approximately, in more than 190 countries. And our section has nearly 10,000 members, and it has the highest number among 57 sections in Region 8. Region 8 covers uh, Europe, Middle East, and the whole of Africa, a massive region with, with 57 sections, and we are the largest section in this uh, region. Now, uh, we have 41 societies, seven technical councils, and new initiatives and local groups. 
uh, and we've undertaken uh, petitions to merge uh, some of our replicating units to try and consolidate. Uh, we have got a major uh, drive to realize our chapter and section officers successions and we have had a big change this year over 30 percent new chairs and officers which is bringing in the next generation of leaders within the section and uh, we are also very keen and as uh, mona said just now we want to improve the diversity quality and inclusion balance within our section and we have taken care to actually make sure that we address that agenda too, all being fair and equal and based on merit, not just because we wanted to do that. And our activities in this area will conclude by the end of May, and we will be giving plaques uh, for recognition to our past chairs. We've got excellent activity profile from all our uh, chapters and groups, and amongst the uh, top uh, sort of groups within uh, Region 8. We always, amongst Region 8, with all the uh, uh, 57 sections within that region, we have we are all we are always topping the activities. And I would like to uh, also say say that we, we we have won awards within Region 8. Actually, top the bill, almost top the bill. Uh, for awards for our sections volunteers and we are pushing forward again to continue to nominate. I would like to also say that the Women in Engineering group who's organizing this event today, uh, the PES and the SIT group in particular, are pushing forward with excellent activities and today's activity, which is uh, sort of themed around technologies and connected cities is a great example. I would have loved to have been there with you all and talk to you. However, I have a little problem, but the technology enables me to be with you and say what I need to say. I would like to give you a little update on the sections of priorities and strategies. We want to activate inactive, uh, inactive chapters and student branches with cross-disciplinary events at section, regional, international levels. And we want to make our, ourselves heard, not just within our section, not just within our region, but internationally. Nothing stops us from sharing and undertaking and delivering our events. And this is what we want to push for within our section, nationally and internationally. We want to promote equality, diversity and inclusion. And we want to also have an agenda within the professional registration activities. We have got uh, uh, a website that is reporting these events, and this is this is very important for us. And you will be able to, regardless of membership, reach the website, watch these events, and benefit from them, just like today's event uh, online. And we are now pushing to consolidate our societies and new initiatives. And we're going to create uh, new award schemes within this section for the chapters that deliver most events in a year to intrinsically facilitate and support other chapters. So we are going to award those who are doing great work and say to them, can you help the others to do as well as yourself? So we are going to uh, give positive feedback for all in terms of support. And we are also going to be recognizing our long serving members. Our con conference sponsorships are going up and we are reviewing our bylaws to ensure that we do things by the rules and things are done correctly. And what we are doing is to basically uh, make sure that when we sponsor conferences, we have a good understanding of what we are doing and how the chapters will get involved. And I think I would like to give credit again to our women in engineering group because they have been in the forefront of sponsoring a number of conferences and they understand the difficulties. But at the same time, it basically gets us involved in large events and gets us heard 
and gets us to be known and participating and contributing to international conferences. Uh, I would like to say that I'm really uh, happy that we are initiating more and more face to face activities. And, you know, this is now in full swing and say sorry again for not being able to be there in person. But next time I, I should be there, hopefully. Uh, we have represented our sec section in Glasgow, Dublin uh, meetings as a section, taking it uh, around the UK and Ireland section. And true to our promise, we've started in Scotland, then Ireland, and then Wales in Cardiff very recently with very successful meetings. And I personally represented the section in face-to-face -face meetings in Region 8 in Cairo, uh, Glasgow, uh, and uh, Bucharest. Uh, so now that's a mistake there. It was Warsaw uh, that I represented the section uh, uh, and uh, uh, Bucharest. There is a mistake there. We shall continue to support our young professionals and student branches. And it's extremely important to note that our student branches have a very healthy mix of young and upcoming individuals who are our future within the IEEE and we have a very strong support for our uh, young professionals and student branches and this is extremely important for us and I would, I would have given a very positive face-to-face -face message with all the, to all the students there so I call upon all the students and young professionals to engage uh, with our new leadership and I'm not sure if our leadership is going is there but they're very proactive. We've got Alina, Serban, and Yinka, two very dynamic young uh, sort of uh, students who are just finishing off their PhDs that are leading our student activities. Please engage with them because there's lots of opportunities. Uh, we are continuing to do milestone events, and we are the top section in Region 8 for having 20 plus milestones which commemorate historical inventions within the UK and Ireland section with plaques. So that's an excellent uh, achievement for us. I would like to also say that we have got our traditional Christmas lecture, which happens in December, every December, at the historic cinema in Regent Street. And please be aware and plan for that. It happens in the second week of December. You'll hear about it very soon with a distinguished lecturer to come uh, and give us a, a lecture. I would like to say thank you very much for listening to me. I'm here to help. You can contact me anytime at my email as given there. I'm always happy to hear from you with your ideas that will contribute to delivering, furthering our mission and priorities for this section. And I will answer questions perhaps later on uh, if there are any. So I wish you a very successful day and event and i look forward to listening to some of the talks thank you down those stairs without breaking my neck. That's the first good thing this morning. Is this microphone working for me, by the way? Thank you. Um, welcome. That's the first thing I have to say is a big, big welcome to everyone here. And then there's a, a lots and lots of thanks to go through before we kick off. I'm keeping this short. There's proper people you want to see, not me. Thank you to Negum and the team for putting this on. This is my first meeting since becoming head of school. I am so pleased that this is taking place. I'm so pleased that this is the meeting it's going to be kicked off with. So, thank you visitors, thank you people online for attending, 
thank you IEEE and Women in Engineering for putting it on, but also thank you home staff for supporting our colleagues and events within the school. That means a lot to me, it really does. At that point, I'm probably going to shut up. Um, apart from one thing, the most important thing a head of school can possibly say, if there is a fire alarm, we do not have any fire alarms planned, so please make your way out. There are fire wardens in the building to assist you. If you are online, please make your own domestic arrangements. Tea is next door and coffee is next door and <laughs> toilets are through there. So I know my place. I know what I have to do. Have a great day. Look forward to meeting a few of you over lunch, etc. Thank you. See you bye. Another big task. I've been asked to introduce Sarah, who is uh, going to be the uh, Vice Chair of Communications and Outreach, who has a video message to be played forward. Thank you. Thank you. So Anything else I've forgotten? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll catch you later. Thank you very Bye. much.
<laughs> Hello, everybody. So, uh, I'm Emmanuel Suki. I'm leading the digital transformation in Vodafone UK. Uh, and I'm here with you to tell you uh, why I'm with the ICPE Women in Engineering. So, I joined the ICPE uh, since 2000. Um, two maybe, so more than 20 years now, but I'm not here to talk about the ITPLE, not uh, to talk about the women in engineering, so I'm specifically talking about ITPLE, Women in Engineering, UKI, the Ambassadors Program. So I joined with Dr. Naram and the team since 2021, uh, and since then we started to do different uh, programs, webinars, uh, conferences, uh, all were online because of the COVID. And I'm really honored and really uh, very pleased to be with you, like in the first face to face event. Uh, I want to tell you that uh, the ITPLE Ambassadors Program uh, is adding to me more than what I'm adding to the program. So it was the main reason why I took this position in Vodafone. So it was not about my academic background, it was not about uh, my industrial background, nothing except that I was. Uh, helping with the ITPLE and uh, things that we already have done together during these two things. Uh, and this was an amazing thing in the CV. Uh, and because of the things that we have done together, I was awarded as the Inspiration Volunteer for 2021. So um, it's never that we are helping with ITPLE. I think uh, ITPLE is helping us more. Uh, and I'm really honored to be with you. Um, and now I'll be um, I, starting. Just, yeah, yes, before sure. you introduce, just, I would like to say that we've been really blessed having you in mind. You. And also, I would like to say hi to our section secretary, Dr. Samia Rani, for joining us. So, thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Thank you for joining yeah. us. Uh, and now we are going to, to start our program with our speakers. So the first speaker will be introduced by uh, one of the industrial uh, Internet of Things research group uh, member, which is Dr. Kurush. So the IIoT research group is a multidisciplinary group with members from engineering and computing background focusing on industry-driven research. Over to you, Dr. Kurush. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's an honor for me to just introduce the next speaker as a professor at Tatiana Kaldorono, as a, a director of the AI Research Center at Brunel University, London. Just a short bio of uh, Professor uh, Tatiana Kaldorono. Uh, she is a professor of intelligence system at Brunel. She has over uh, 25 years experience uh, designing, implementing applied intelligence systems and inventor of six patent technologies and author of over 120 papers uh, in highly respected journal and conference proceedings. And she and her team at Brunel has got lots of the success and achievements, uh, just including uh, just a few of them, champions of the 2019 Microelectronics Supply Chain uh, Permanence Challenge, ranked number one and ranked number two overall for novel and summary based deep learning approaches, ranked number one uh, for uh, hybridizations, LSDM, and capsules uh, for change cones, uh, and outlier detections for SCAR, uh, data sets, and polling optimizations, and graph uh, mathematics into caterpillar occurrence and genstone uh, supply chain optimization process resulted in multiple internal and external international awards, including 2016 Caterpillar uh, Chairman's Award for Business Innovation, 2016 Global uh, Excellence in Analytics Awards, 2017 finalists for the informed innovation in Analytics Prize and uh, 29, uh, 2020 uh, winner of Brunel's Research Impact Awards. Uh, thank you very much. So I'd like to just invite uh, Professor uh, Tatiana to just come and give a presentation, which is about uh, the topic, is a very interesting topic, towards environmentally friendly AI, useful data lead to higher accuracy. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me better now? 
Which one you prefer? The second one, yeah? I'm afraid technology doesn't work today very well, so we'll just decide, okay? You, you, you hear me better now? Okay. Okay, thank you very much for introduction. Just listen and always I was just impressed how well you present myself. So it's about presentations that's coming up. Uh, we are coming from AI. So nowadays, like any any area you will touch, you will be speaking about AI. Healthcare, construction, uh, business, finance. So anywhere we'll be looking, we are looking on AI. So uh, I will, I'm working in AI. Unfortunately, I'm not newcomer, so I know ups and downs of this area rather than just get, getting on the way. And uh, that's why, for example, I'm very much realistic when we can trust AI and when, when we cannot trust. Working with uh, quite few companies as uh, during my process, like sort of nowadays, all industries want to in implement AI. Think about 15 years ago, how many of the companies will openly say that we use AI? Not really a lot, yes, but we will use it. But at the same time, while we were doing this, I was discovering quite a lot of uh, challenges that we need to overcome even before coming on and uh, combining research ch challenges with business challenges. It was helping us to get a bit of scaling up. And that's why all these awards coming up from no not nowhere, but understanding both worlds rather than one altogether. So, um, uh, I come from, uh, I'm director of AI Center in Brunel. We cover both nowadays from social interactions to digital interactions. And if you will have a look, application areas is very much wide, from robotics to some art for volcanic analysis and so on. So basically, we have touched AIs in very various areas, but what we are trying to aim, we are trying to aim not only using AI, but delivering quality. So if we are doing something, it must be really very good and how it's coming up. So and, uh, with current wave of AI and everyone is using it, so basically we really want to be and show that we are good in it. So not only using the models, but developing new ones and how it comes. Here we come. So we are not Google, we are not Facebook. In uh, Brunel, we don't have a lot of computational resources AI requires. So what it means, we have to be creative. We have to be creative to still deliver quality and how it's got. So this is where we are looking now, not about how to get AI and get the bit, but we started to realize the importance of majority of imagine is about how to find out what data are useful for machine learning. So to bring our accuracy up with very little data we have. Why is it important? Let's have a look about smart connect, uh, connected cities. We use a lot of IOTs. We have a lot of data. We cannot afford ourselves to have very large models, but we want to have accuracy up. How can we do this if we are not increasing the data? So we need to be very smart thinking where and how to, uh, to use the data. I will show you a little bit of revelation how it comes. And just for you to see, oops, I'm going in the wrong direction, apologies. So what we are looking for, we are looking for some directions where we are using less power, less data, but we are getting more accurate models. If we are going to start to understand the meaning of the data, useful data, that will bring us accuracy up, we'll save a lot of computational power, we'll save a lot on storage, because at the moment, everyone is trying to store all data just in case we lose some values. But at the same time, understand what data are not important anymore for you and coming around. If we start to understand these areas, we'll be able to deliver talks and, and deliver the systems that will be very fast, accurate, smart, and high, uh, high accuracy will go up rather than down by losing the data. So this is I'm constantly going opposite sorry about it. All right. So um, what I will show you, I'll show you an example with age classification because it's easier to understand how, what we are doing rather than time series data. We do both. 
but it's something that it comes together. Last year, when we started to have a look how we can get ranked number one in other data sets everyone is, is liking about, so we started to do a bit of literature review. Everyone by now, if you're doing machine learning, you know that the most desirable data set to work on is ImageNet. ImageNet has millions of images. It means it requires a lot of computational power. So you should know your competitors before you start to think about how to design and what to do. So what we've done, we basically uh, get the last 40 best state of art papers coming up. And you can really see, for example, uh, for ImageNet, um, with its accuracy going gradually up. And can you see these gray dots? Gray dots represent number of papers has been published trying to get there. So popularity of these data sets and researchers are looking and experimenting with its increases. But what we are interested in, not everyone who is uh, looking into this, how people get the new state of art. Where did you get there? Yeah, because if we will learn how they manage to get to the next step, we can beat them. Okay. So, so we know that it's coming up. We choose 40 uh, highest accuracies achieved. So we are not looking only on cases. We are looking the best of the best. If we are looking for the best of the best, we start to understand who is using what. Nine. Uh, nine of 22 works so were not reviewed because we are using transformers. They are very much computationally very greedy uh, networks. It means for IoT applications, we won't be able to use them because they would require a lot of energy and our batteries will run out quicker than we can just get solutions up. So we need to get small networks, very efficient, coming around. So, how can I get the... Um, Yes, yeah. Can you see? Oh, yeah. Can you see? This is number of parameters we have. Yeah. The image net has 3 billion images. Now, everyone who wanted to get the ranking top, can you see additional number of images we are adding? Data set has 3 billion images. They add additional 3 billion to go up. So we are basically, in order to get one run of epoch of network, it's to get 6 billion images to evaluate. And it's not anyone who won. So we basically, number eight was doing not bad, 300 million. So we can see that there is a major tendency. Everyone is increasing the accuracy. In order to increase the accuracy, you need to double, triple the data. And frankly speaking, if you have 3 billion images, when you, now you look at 300 million, it's nothing when you will compare with 3 billion. Does it like, we see the perception going on? So we are basically looking on tendency of increasing data to get the accuracy up. Working on the edge computing and smart cities, can we afford this? Not really. So let's have a look at another case. Different type of network, the story is the same. People increasing, doubling the data set just to get the accuracy. Just to get this small accuracy up. Some more. Not bad. So basically, one, after these two examples which I showed you, when we are speaking about 300 million adding up, it's absolutely nothing. Just to get the accuracy up and beat the next state of art. Okay? So we start to understand we need to add more data. Adding the data, it means additional storage. It means computational power and resources. It's good if you have it. It's not if you're not having it. And unfortunately, we don't. So we started to have a look all structures. And you could see, for example, this model like teaching student network is not so much data gritty. But the ranking is not near of number one or two or three. So five, six, it's good, but it's not getting there. If we will have a look on accuracy ranking and number of data it comes, parameters necessary, can you see? Everyone it gets in store 10, it gets very high number of data required. Can you see it? So basically, closer you are to the new state of art, more data you have to add. 
Otherwise, you will not get anywhere. Well, if I start to think about this, I start to think about how much computational power I need. We calculated this for 3 billion images. Yeah? So if I will be using CPUs of version 3 core graphics, we, I would need to spend about $300,000 to pay to Google to run one run on ImageNet. No one is going to fund us this type of money to get one run. And anyone who is working on AI, will one run be sufficient for me? No, forget. So basically, we are immediately out of competition. Okay, now, okay, fine. So we have consumer GPUs in our center. So, so we have consumer GPUs in our center. So uh, we calculated we'll need to have 18 years to run these winning models just to have one run. We double checked who were number one, two, three, four in ranking. Any wild guess who was there? Google, Facebook, Twitter. So research centers which have all this computational power, they're basically speeding up. Can, can, I, can, can we, with my team, compete against them? We are out of competition, so we cannot get there. We are out of competition, it doesn't mean that we can beat them. Okay, I'll give you an example, like sort of, uh, you were presenting me very well, when we were doing Apex competition, we beat and become champions against the team which has half million worth of equipment. My team had 1,000 pounds worth of equipment and we beat them. So it means being creative, it's help. Okay, so we know that we are out of competition if we'll start to add, so we need to start to understand where and what we are coming and which direction to get. Because nowhere we can compete against all these brilliant uh, teams who have unlimited resources to come. Well, what we've done, we started very small. Because if you understand the problem small, we can scale it up. We have PCBs, simple PCBs data. So basically, I think you have some people from uh, uh, electronic engineering department. So what we've done, instead of just basically using the PCBs, we try to get camera and get the PCBs under different angles pictures. So what we've done, instead of adding different pictures chaotically into our network, we started to try to have a look what data will be more important and less important to get. So we collected all this data. And what we've done, we've done something which is called the uh, UMAP, just to, okay, fine. We get five minutes, so I'll just get you there and the rest you will ask me later. So we uh, just to understand where it's coming. So what we've done, this is our class distributions. We have three strategies, and I want to find out your answers here. We have three strategies. Uh, shall we run our network and keep data which are in the center of distribution? Shall we run our network and keep the data outside of distribution only, or shall we get random reduction of the data? And what, when, where will we get the best results? Any wild guess? Come on. Center, yes? So we have center. Anyone else? Come on. Center. Everyone is center, yes? Can we get hands up who is for center? Come on, it's like so, yeah, so just get there. A anyone for outside? Anyone for random distribution of the data? Have you seen that everyone is looking either the center or random number distribution, yeah? Guess what's happening? The most important, what we found out is with our experience, the most important data is outside. You get more data outside and you reduce data inside, your accuracy is going up. Any standard data set which you are playing around, like MNES, Fashion, so basically they give you, I reduce the data centrally and I get higher accuracy. 
We run, I think, 100 times this experiment because no one believed it. Because have you seen like an audience? When I ask you, do you have anyone who said about center? It's not going to work. And apparently it's the most important data. It means when we design our system, we know our distribution in the classes. We will know what data to keep and what data not to keep. These very small things, when we start to experiment with data augmentation techniques, so how to get there, most of them I'm asking what type of data augmentation I did. I try this, it doesn't work. I try this, it doesn't work. Yeah? But all this data augmentation, they do add either on the boundaries or in the center. The one language in the center, will they work? No. Because we have done fully control experiment. Yeah? The ones which is outside, any data documentation that you enrich with data will push the accuracy up. Small thing, not a lot, but if we learn what value, what data bring us, we will start to design environmentally friendly AIs where we will have very limited power resources, but we'll push accuracy up. Believe it or not, we reduce data sets by 15% is a lot, yeah? And we get better state, new state of art by not adding the data, reducing the data. But reducing data intelligently. I think I get my five minutes, Maybe. yes? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is our message. I have far more to say, but it's if you're interested, come back to me on the lunch time. I can, I can stick around. Okay? So remember, outside, not inside the data. Thank you. Thank you. We have the questions after lunch time. We need to go to the next meeting. So the second speaker is introduced by Dr. Asya, one of the water energy food tech and access research team. The BF team is aiming to optimize the interlinkage and interdependencies of these three resource sectors. Thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Peter Nike. Um, he is going to talk about capabilities to twins for smart cities. Uh, Dr. Reiki is the CTO and founder at Slingshot Simulations, which specializes in building digital twin solutions for cities to support their net zero journeys. He is also the OMG Digital Twin Consortium of Capability and Technology Working Group Chair. He has led their work on defining the best practice reference architecture. David is also one of the leading members of the Responsible Computing Initiative. He is a Royal Academy of Engineering Enterprise Fellow and alumnus from the University of Oxford Site Business School Creative Destruction Lab. David is also a guest lecturer on digital twins at the University of Leeds and Oxford. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to try and use this microphone based off the previous uh, experience. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, today, looking forward to meeting you all and getting to know all over coffee and lunch. So, what am I going to be talking about? I'm going to be talking really about best practice for building this thing we call digital twins. Looking at how we can use these and apply them across a broad range of case studies on things that we've just heard about to make a massive positive impact on the world we live in. A bit of extra background on myself. Slingshot Simulation is a startup based in Leeds in the UK. We deliver digital twin smart city and net zero solutions to local authorities across the UK. The impact there, we're roughly saving per local authority roughly a million to a million and a half dollars per year for local authorities to help them plan the deployment of smart cities. So they don't know what they want to do. And they don't know where they want to do it. And one of the key words is doing it in a democratic, inclusive way that takes account of demography, diversity, and inclusion. And I'll give one example. Before I start, we all think the same. We want electric cars everywhere, but there is no point building electric charging infrastructure 
in a part of the city where no one can afford the next car. Until they can afford the next car, we're wasting millions in building that infrastructure. And unfortunately, that is happening all across the UK, all across the US and Europe and further afield. The Digital Print Consortium is part of OMG, very much looking at software standards. And I've spent the last 18 months working with these guys to define what I'm going to now talk about. We need to define a best practice, best practice guide, reference architecture, and framework for adopting digital twin infrastructure. Yeah, that's fine. I can move. I can, I'll try and stay still. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll try. One of the key things here is looking at how do we not make the same mistakes time and time again particularly looking at research institutions and startups and small companies, where every time we say, let's build the whole thing, let's build that compute infrastructure that we've just been hearing about, that's a quarter of a million pounds to build. How do we do that in an effective way? So I've spent the last 18 months working with these guys. One of the key things we've defined is this definition of a sustainable digital twin. And there's two dimensions to it. I can talk more about this over lunch. Firstly, you building digital twins that offer sustainable objectives. Not just building for smart, smart cities, not just for mobility, not just for whatever other use case, but actually targeting value and impact on the world we live in. But also building in a responsible computing fashion. And I'll give one more stat. Every year we, ge we generate roughly 175 zettabytes of data. That generates, store that, just on hardware spinning, 6.4 million tons of carbon per year. That is equivalent to the 80 smallest countries' cumulative carbon emissions. And as the UK, we are probably responsible for a rather large amount of it. So this raises a big question of how we do it. And digital twins are part of that. Let me dive into the capabilities piece. So over the last 18 months to two years, We've worked with my colleagues across 270 CTOs to define a periodic table. This has two layers in it, and we won't go into all of it. Well, what we have found is across every single one of those businesses, every single one of their products will fit into a subset of this periodic table. And the reason for doing this is when we're trying to engage stakeholders, whether this is funders, whether this is governments, we're able to talk about the case studies at this high level objective that everybody can understand, rather than me talking about regression or principal component analysis or co-simulation or simulated annealing, whatever other technique that is actually of interest to me, because the funders or the clients don't understand. And I'll give a case study in a second. This has been very useful. What we've found is that virtually every single example that we work through will have a capability from at least one, one capability in each of these colored sections, at least one, typically two or three per color section. It's a very powerful exercise, and we've found that in terms of scoping your technical requirements, we've found that this can reduce that scoping exercise from six months to typically two to three weeks in terms of engaging stakeholders. We then extend this framework and we've taken it even further. We apply this across a best practice reference architecture, which also done in partnership with the IIC, which is responsible for the Industry 4.0 program out of Germany. And defining a guide where we see, again, simple terms, how do we get to stakeholders, and then diving in more depth, what are the key building blocks for building these architectures? Because the reality is that someone who's been building these systems, if you start from a blank piece of paper, you always forget something, no matter how much you try. So building this best practice guide, and there's a white paper coming out on this in a couple of weeks' time. Um, but there's also a few other as well that go through this. This was co-architected with myself, Dell Technologies, Microsoft, and Bentley Systems, who are one of the leading proponents of simulation for cities. The key elements here, a lot of it's very obvious. We have an IT platform, we have to run these things in an efficient manner, but the most important element is the synchronization, which you'll see in the top right, because one of the key elements is how do we get data into these systems? We're talking about machine learning, how do we get that volume of data across our networks in a timely manner? Is it real time? Is it soft real time? Is it hard real time? Do we not really care? Is a floppy disk good enough? Um, I have worked in situations where only last year we're still using floppy disks. Um, how do we do that? How do we manage that? 
Is this a factory plant setting? Is it transport? Actually, do we, do we care? How quickly can we respond to these systems? Has a lot of implications. And that purple box there on the top right has more design decisions than the rest of it put together in our experience into how we manage to get that data across. So let me talk through some examples. I'm going to talk through an example that we finished um, at Slingshot just last year, and this is following the same framework. So here we're looking at North Northamptonshire, a part of the UK, just north of London here, and looking at how do we help them plan for the net zero journey. First of all, we start by looking at the capabilities that they are interested in. Again, engaging the stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders? Politicians, civil engineers, and geologists, not a single software engineer, computer scientist, electrical engineer in the road or anywhere near the project. So actually going through this allowed us to very quickly, and this was done in half a day. We didn't have long to do this. We needed to deliver a full result working solution within four months. We couldn't waste time. Go through this process, actually found we missed a couple, fill it out and identify these are the key elements they needed for their digital twin for net zero planning to hit their targets by 2030. We're then able to apply that into technology selection, apply slingshot technology, open source technology, and others to look at how we deliver an impact. And this solution has now been deployed in Corby, and we've identified that within the first year, they will be able to find 3.4 tons, which isn't very much, 3.4 tons of CO2 savings immediately. And that's before they build it. So that's the level of impact that these types of solutions can have. The potential impact when it comes to adoption of electric vehicles and so forth is more interesting. And there is a paper that I'm happy to share with delegates later that has just literally been published yesterday. So we'll be able to include. Other case studies that we're applying these to as well, which again are, are all public now. So we're working with a team in Singapore, helping them look at disease infection management and to understand how are how is data being captured in the hospital and particularly post COVID. How do we stream that in real time and allow us to quickly translate that to other hospitals across the world because we see the same things happening. Following the same process of mapping the case study through that capability periodic table, through to a reference architecture, allowing delivery, and the 3D image you see at the top is of the actual hospital, and this is currently in the under active development at the moment with a, a partner company called Axima. Another thing going on and um, looking at carbon reporting, this is primarily happening in Germany, but we're now applying this in the state of New York as well. This is being led by Microsoft in partnership with Bosch. Again, how do we report this? Because actually, I'm sure, I don't know how many of you have tried to calculate scope one, two, or three emissions. It's nigh on impossible to get, and you're pretty much guessing. So how do we take this? How do we use digital twins, modeling simulation, inspired, built on real data to do so? And again, we follow this framework. And again, there's a paper on this one as well. We applied the same thing for disaster recovery. This is in the Caribbean as well as in Indonesia. Looking at how do we, and this is a more interesting one, how do we capture data where the infrastructure has not gone? Because there's been an earthquake, there's been a tornado, a hurricane, whatever. Well, now we're working with Northrop Grumman looking at satellite data, streaming that in real time, where at a flip of a button, we can now start analyzing that, and that is very, interesting because real-time satellite data is not particularly helpful because it depends on what angle the satellite is at. And satellites do not pass over the same point very often at exactly the same angle. So from a computer vision, machine learning perspective, it's really, really hard. You have to use techniques like INSAR and so forth, but you need eight weeks of data to do that. Not particularly suited to responding in real time to a hurricane that's just come through and saving lives. But building these systems to now be preventative, predictive, so we can start recording the data until the point that the infrastructure disappeared and then augment with new data as we go through. And this is one that I'm more personally uh, more deep, uh, deeply involved in, which gets really interesting from a legislative perspective. So here we're looking at the infrastructure of buildings. This is again in New York and this is part of a program that's been legislated by the state of New York, which says by 2030, all school buses have to be electric. There are just over 10,000 school buses, and at the moment, only 100 of them are electric across the state, which means they're going to miss their targets by a mile. 
However, they have no, no charging infrastructure. Um, they're therefore looking at possibly can they go to hydrogen, but they're not allowed to bring hydrogen into the city to charge and fill. And that's been legislated since World War II. So how do we prove a safety case that it's actually safe to bring this hydrogen into the city so you can fill these buses? It's not as explosive as it used to be, but we still don't want to blow up a city block for, with good reason. How do we do that? How do we model this and then track it all the way through? But it turns out that that infrastructure also allows us to power entire city blocks with clean energy. So the impact is massive. And we're testing this in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is an innovation space, um, where one of the big food manufacturers has actually provided some of their facilities so that we don't have to bring it by the road so we can ship it in instead. Hopefully, I've gone quite quickly and conscious of time, but I wanted to give a kind of feeling of where we're seeing digital twins, where we're seeing that approach. I'm happy to talk through it in more detail later. How we're taking capabilities through a technology selection process and what we're able to find is that working with academics, working with researchers, industry across the board, we're able to move to value creation quickly. And that is the key thing is we're not interested in building digital twins that will deliver value in three years time it's deliver value in three weeks and continue delivering value for the following three years. And I will leave it there. Thank you. She's the Director of Research at Huawei R&D UK, where she provides strategic direction on AI research and innovation as part of the company's work around the development of responsible AI. Dr. Nasir is a founding editorial board member of the Springer Journal on AI and Ethics. She sits on, on all party parliamentary group on data analytics, and her profile interview has been published as Inspirational Women at We Are Tech Women Amongst Inspirational Tech Advocates. We welcome her. Thank you. Hello um, and good morning. I hope the uh, sound is clear. Um, if it's not, please let me know. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity, uh, especially to the members of uh, IEEE uh, Women in Engineering, uh, Nagam and Mona, for having this opportunity to uh, actually extend my research and thoughts on the very important topic of uh, future sustainable societies and smart cities with ethical and um, trusted exit.
I hope the slide uh, changes. Could you see the next slide? So within the uh, smart or sustainable societies of the future, uh, we could envisage that many uh, of our normal or day-to-day uh, -day, uh, practices would change in a way that we would have uh, more reliability on technology. We would have more reliability on the models that are generated by AI in every sector of the uh, daily life of a person, for example, retail, automotive, um, healthcare, uh, jurisdiction, schooling, shopping, whatever you name, um, are already being impacted by the artificial intelligence. And we can see that how this has influenced the way we live today. This has influenced the way we use technology. This is as we use the uh, traditional um, uh, political systems or uh, landscape that has also changed. So you can see how uh, we are uh, getting into an era with more uh, and more reliability on the artificial intelligence and AI uh, is nothing without data. So as the previous speakers have also mentioned about the data and how the large volumes of data are being generated a daily basis. The challenge here is that how do we use these large volumes of data to uh, assure sustainable societies? And also, do we need to enable trust in AI? And if we do, how do we do that? And also, um, are we going to go beyond the sustainable society? So uh, UNESCO also talks about uh, sustainable development programs, sustainable societies. But do we also think about trusted excellence in these sustainable societies? Because without trust, we cannot have uh, sustainability that can be a guarantee for the future uh, societies. So the science behind the data is uh, mainly, it's, it's a lot, and it's being generated, as I said, on a daily basis. We need the data to generate actual insights. We need the data to solve complex AI problems. We do need the data uh, for sophisticated AI models. Without the data, we don't have uh, an, an, an adequate outcome from an artificial intelligence system or algorithm. So data is the key, and uh, there is a growing trend of making these data publicly available as well. And you could see all these initiatives, you can search them, Google them online. So some of the very common um, um, you know, statements I've heard is that, is data the new plastic? I think it is. Many people have been commenting on this. There are lots of books published on this. And what we mean by data is a new plastic. The data is a new plastic because it's been generated. We want to keep it. We won't want to throw it away. But then how do we manage it? How do we keep track of what we're doing is ethical? How do we keep track of uh, all the different, um, uh, you know, uh, trends and issues that come with it? So you can see on this slide, it's kind of three different aspects. The professional aspects, the legal aspects, and the ethical aspects to do with the data issues. And I would not go into the detail, but by all means, please uh, feel free to take a snapshot if you want about the data quality issues, access issues, privacy issues, fairness issues, oversight issues. These are all there, like uh, you know, stars in the sky, and we hear about them on a daily basis in news in media, in public uh, podcasts, in professionals and experts talking about it, even laymen talking about it. Even people like patients talking about, where is my data? I need to have access to my data. You cannot do anything uh, with my data without my permission, without my consent. So these are very stories that we hear on a daily basis, and it makes it a serious concern. And um, the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, is, is also an example of a control management uh, system that was brought to a few years ago. We talk about the rights of people. They have given any rights to the people, the right of access, right of uh, information erasure, right of data different rights that never existed before. So the, the, the old data act was modified to enable more rights for the people. 
there's a growing trend of making data publicly available, as we know, but with this comes a lot of risks. When data becomes publicly available, do we consider data minimization? Do we consider data anonymization? Do we consider uh, several aspects that need to be considered uh, within the need to trust, within the need of morality, within the need for the dignity? Because dignity is fundamental to human rights. As humans, we need to be respected, we need to be dignified. And if somebody or some organization or some entity, even an AI model, uses our data uh, without our consent, that is to be considered. So data cleansing, reduction, minimization, anonymization, and different techniques that can be used to, to manage. Now, what about the data ethics? Do we consider that as important? Do we consider there needs to be some sort of ethical values around the usage of data? And does governance of data need to be in place? When, when I talk about data ethics, uh, it includes factors such as you know, accessibility, compliance, security, privacy, privacy, data quality, and integrity. And these are all interrelated. We talk about future cities. We talk about future sustainable societies. If there is no integrity, if there is no respect, if there is no dignity, if there is no uh, security and compliance, then how can we guarantee that the future cities would be sustainable and they would be trusted. When people are not satisfied, when they are not content that they can trust the, the solution they're going into. Uh, we go into the bank for a mortgage application or an loan application, and the, the person who's sitting in front of the computer screen says, your application is rejected. Now what? Somebody has to tell me why it's rejected, right? Um, the computer doesn't say that you are accepted, so that's it. Bye bye. So as a, uh, a citizen, as, as a normal person, my grandma, for example, needs to know why she's been deprived of this loan grant. And that is very important for ensuring the human dignity because we as humans need to know our rights and we as human need to know why this has been uh, taken away from me or I'm not allowed to do so. There has to be some sort of explainability element which can enable trust and guarantee that we can trust these data. So um, the data governance is important as well. I'll give you a little bit of uh, a snapshot within the uh, the global leadership landscape on the AI trustworthiness and ethics. Um, for for uh, for 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 the sake of information, uh, there are several uh, initiatives, not only on the national level but also on the national, international, and global level, which are working towards uh, the uh, trust and towards the uh, data ethical values. For example, the OECD, the UNESCO, they they publish recommendations, which has been taken up by over 200 member states uh, as one of the. Uh, Top, uh, one of the top uh, manifestos that can be followed for, for the ethical and trustworthiness of data. We have the Global Sustainable Goals, the UN SDGs, the European Commission has published their trustworthiness guidelines. So the challenges still prevail. We have not got a solution. The problem still is there that could we yet have actionable models without compromising the data privacy? And how do we manage uh, with efficiently the ever-growing data deluge? So these are still research problems for most of the students or for most of the researchers who want to explore this. Um, it, it's a very interesting problem to explore. A little bit glimpse again about an initiative which is uh, conducted by Spanish government. Uh, it is the launch of the AI Sandbox. It's the world's first sandbox uh, on AI. Sandbox is an experimental testbed that has been launched in June uh, last year, and it would screen the high-risk applications. So what they are using, their approach is a risk-based based approach. So from small, low-risk to medium-risk to high-risk applications of AI, they would be screened and scrutinized against the AI Act, uh, the, the law, the regulation, and then the companies or the uh, developers of those applications would be allowed to put it to the market. Uh, otherwise, it would not be. Um, I would not go into the 
meter for this one because again this is a huge thing for the sandboxes i would say it's a test bed and for experimentation environment for testing the various models or algorithms or different um, mechanisms that you develop as part of your ai pipeline and you can use uh, you can use a sandbox to test and trial your applications to test and trial your standards to test and trial your processes and to test and trial your models and algorithms as i said earlier uh, the government uh, especially the european government the european commission uh, pays a lot of heat on this they are encouraging uh, encouraging the use of sandboxes they are encouraging uh, to put projects and applications and products to trial so that they can ensure they are compliant with the eu ai act of course, there are benefits and limitations. I mean, uh, I would not go into the detail because of the time concern, so uh, I would go to the next slide. Um, within the ecosystem of uh, a trusted excellence, uh, we have uh, an ecosystem of trust on one side and then the ecosystem of excellence on the other side. Within the ecosystem of trust, we have different bodies that are standardization bodies. For example, the ISO, IEC, JTC1, JTC21, Sen Senelec. Uh, please feel free to Google these because they're all available online. Um, and it might be some alien terms for people who are not having any background for the standards, but people who are interested in artificial intelligence, who want to develop the models and algorithms, or who want to pursue their career in artificial intelligence, I think it is very useful for them. I would recommend them to understand and to learn a bit more on the standardizations around AI and how they are uh, playing an important role within generating an ecosystem of trust in the uh, European landscape. In the ecosystem of uh, excellence side, on, on the right-hand side, I believe that would be your right as well, we have the sandboxes, we have the experimentation facilities, we have different organizations coming together to produce proprietary sandboxes. And we are also seeing that governments are encouraging uh, sandboxes on, on, on national levels, which, which is the Spanish uh, AI sandbox as an, as an example. Uh, so last but not the least, we have the ecology. Now, this uh, this slide is pretty uh, pretty populated, but it encapsulates all the elements of uh, the AI ecosystem that need to interoperate interoperate with each other. Uh, such interpolations is important to enable trusted excellence. We have harmonization of standards, we have policy and regulations, we have testing and evaluation, and we have the trusted outcomes as a result from coming from the devices, the services, the clouds, the platforms, the infrastructures. We cannot ignore one or the other. They play a key role. They are different actors of the same ecosystem. And it's like a jigsaw puzzle. One breakdown, the other have an impact on it. So. Um, we we have to consider that in order to enable uh, artificial intelligence systems that are trusted uh, and that play a vital role in sustainable societies, in future societies, it is imperative to build trust in them. It is imperative to have compliance with the AI Act, for example, and with general uh, legislative measures. Even for the UK, uh, in March uh, this year, last, uh, a couple of months ago, March, March 2023, the UK government uh, published a pro-innovation approach to AI, and they have released their white paper. Um, and uh, th this, this gives an insight as to how important the topic is when we are going further. And every organization, for example, if some of the students would like to pursue their career in industry or academia, or they would like to have, uh, you know, uh, 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 jobs applied into the area of artificial intelligence, it is very important for them to understand that the laws are going to be there very soon. The AI Act is going to be there in a, in, in a year or two. And even UK is implementing regulations. So without the regulation, AI is not going to be uh, feasible. So the sooner we learn and adapt, the sooner we, we, we kind of be developing this um, ethics by design, we say that. Uh, so just the, the final slide. Um, in the past, we used to uh, say that ethical impacts are important okay uh, but but they are unclear we don't know what we need to do ethics is not new okay it has been there in philosophy 
uh, for over 50 or 70, 100 odd years. Uh, there are uh, more than 100 bioethical principles, but those bioethical principles are now narrowed down into a framework for an ethical uh, ethical implementation of AI, which is very specific to the governance, which is very specific to the AI fairness, which is very specific to the you know, bias mitigation, human oversight or human dignity. It is very specific to, uh, it encapsulates the AI explainability, how the models can be explainable, how the AI application outcomes can be explainable. I gave you an example of the of the banking application, the mortgage loan application, how these things have an impact. If someone says, why should we explain it? I think it, it would be uh, um, a question of, uh, um, a question that does not even have any validity because we as humans, as I said, have the right to be explained and answered why this has become of my claim, my insurance, my healthcare premium, whatever. So we need to know. And in, in, in order for us to know, these answers need to be embedded within the architecture, within the pipeline, within the main uh, pipeline of the machine learning algorithms. Today, we are there. We are actually, uh, if you Google, there are more than 250 frameworks around the globe. <laughs> 250 ethical frameworks and one might get confused oh my god which one to follow there's so many but then there are some standards which are being considered for example the OECD the UNESCO the IEEE um, ethically aligned design and now we are establishing trustworthy guidelines around AI in the future uh, what we need to have is by design approach so there are uh, morally controversial situations that need to be transparent and explainable for example uh, an accident on the road, you know, or uh, the trolley problem. I don't know if you're aware of the trolley problem, but if you're not, please Google it. I won't take more time. Um, so it, these aspects need to be considered for future sustainable societies. And the ecosystem I mentioned on the previous slide, all the actors we need to consider within the harmony uh, for the implementation. Thank you very much. I hope this was useful. I cannot hear anything, <laughs> so <laughs> if somebody needs to unmute. <laughs> yes, thank you. So three minutes and we'll have that of the break. So if we have any questions, so we need to ask. Maybe the speaker needs coffee now, so. <laughs> So we'll have a 15 minutes break and then we'll come back. Can I, can I ask a question, please? Yes, oh, yes sure, please. Uh, this is Izzet. Um, let me put my video on so you can see who I am. That was a very, very nice talk, Aisha. It was enlightening. Um, I'm aware that there are uh, standards and uh, legislations uh, being put in place, and you've said it yourself, there is loads of them around. What do you think is going to be the scene in two years time from now, not one year, but two years time from now, and how much of this is going to be reliable with all the AI tools around that can mimic and emulate and personify and pretend to be. So there will be even more confusion and you touched upon the reliability and uh, all the rest of it. So you are a professional working in this area. Can you give us your view, please? A very nice question and thanks for asking. Um, within, I mean, the, the perspective of AI, it's, it's very dynamic. It changes on a daily basis, okay? And there are uh, not dozens, but millions of dozens of applications being developed on a daily basis. You have the example of Chat GPT. Nobody knew what's going to happen, and then it just came, and there was lots of you know tussle and lots of uh, discussion and cross discussions about it. From the legislative perspective, there are some certainties. It's not completely out of the blue. From the regulation perspective, especially the AI Act, uh, we can foresee, and based on my meetings with some of the members of the Parliament of the European Commission. We are expecting that to be in place by 2025, for example. So when that happens, the act is a regulation. It's a law. 
then things become more stringent. They become more tight from the scrutiny perspective, from the perspective of more control, from the perspective that um, we will not be having a free will market you know, like anybody develops an application or develops a product and take it to the market and start selling it. They would have to go through certain legislative checks. They would have to go through certain conformity assessment measures and compliance measures so that they 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 are they are conforming. They are actually uh, you know matching the criteria, and then they will be assessed based on the risk. So if it is a very high risk application, for example, healthcare or you know somebody needs to make a decision about my hip surgery, and you know is very sensitive or it is less life threatening you know as compared to to, to this so um going two years forward there would be more stricter uh, legislative measures and more strict um um uh, you know, uh, conformity assessment measures. And also having said that, they, there is a call for, I think in one of the slides I did mention about the harmonized standards. So from the European Commission, there has been a call for harmonization, harmonization of standards. And that's where these bodies like ISOIC, JTC1, SC42, and the uh, JTC21, the Sensenelec, they come into play because they are actually now, I, I'm also a member of these committees. So we are actually now developing the standard experts all around the globe developing the uh, technical specifications and the technical requirements around the standards which are important for the conformance of AI. So things are getting to a more mature uh, phase from that perspective. But which application will come, we don't know. I mean, it could be something completely different. It could be something like the next generation of the chat GPT, which is not even considered by the standards. And we say, you know what? We haven't considered this in the standardization. So it's, it, because AI is not stopping. It's kind of going on and on and on. And so, yeah, but, but, but there is a need for ongoing efforts. Thank you for the question. Thank you for that answer. Very useful and shape of things to come. Very exciting. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. So it's complicated now. Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And she is the ABK communication regular to Ocon. She leads the engineer team in support of uh, Ocon Spectrum work, provide technical uh, policy insight, test and measurement capability and contribution to international standard. Uh, Emma holds a degree in engineering and has been working in the telecom industry for the over 20 years and in operation and leadership role in the UK and international. Please, Amelia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Right, so uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, today, and I think this is an excellent uh, initiative, this uh, IEEE Women in Engineering event. We need more of these. It's, it's a great opportunity to share insights and knowledge, and I find by having these cross-disciplinary presentations, you really get a lot of different insights and in how they interweave amongst each other. So again, um, very much uh, celebrate having events and opportunities like this and for everyone do take the opportunity to um, learn and also to make some links and, and network and connect with other people because that's a big part of it. So to introduce, uh, so my name is Armel Boisset, I'm the Director of uh, Engineering at Ofcom which is the UK Communications Regulator. Um, I'll explain, try to explain in my presentation a bit of what that entails and how that relates to smart cities. Um, so I'll move. This one? There we go. There we go. Uh, so, Ofcom being the regulator, we regulate wireless communications. And essentially, anything that isn't cabled connected is, is wireless. Um, and therefore, that applies to a huge swathe of uh, technologies across all sectors and industries and, and uh, society as well. The um, 
we regulate it for most efficient use of the spectrum at different frequencies and different ranges. We take into account the requirements from different stakeholders, so different be they um, industry, um, consumers, other, other organizations that all want to have access to this, uh, this capability. And as part of smart cities, there's a huge amount of connected devices that come into play. The, uh, we want to support innovative new wireless, um, wireless solutions while ensuring that existing solutions also operate. And part of that is increasingly around sharing the spectrum, and I'll come to that in, uh, in a bit. We facilitate a range of options, and there are different technologies that apply, uh, depending on the use and the, uh, the requirements, ranging from mobile, which most, I think everyone will have a mobile in their pocket, um, as well as Wi-Fi, uh, satellite, TV, radio, Bluetooth, and, and more. And I will also touch on some specific considerations to do with smart cities. Now, the diagram you can see here gives a good example of different types of wireless technologies in use for a production line, ranging from Wi-Fi uh, to 5G as a, as a private network, LoRa, which is a technology that's used for very, very local connects, local networks, similarly to Bluetooth, and uh, and for and others. And again, it's it depends on the application, on the technology which solution uh, you go for, and different rules and standards apply to each of these. Um, what I will also add is that in our, if within Ofcom, we look at both the engineering side of things, which is which I'm involved in, and that is the, 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 the mathematical underpinning and the, the evidence to support the policies that are then put into place as to how those um, those capabilities are rolled out. And when someone deploys a uh, capability, the spectrum is not generally the first thing they think about. You really think about what are your requirements, what is it that you're trying to deploy, what are the needs. So to take two differing examples, one would be, for instance, uh, a smart bin. A smart bin will only need to send a signal maybe once a day to say I'm full or I'm one third full, I'm two thirds full, here's where I am. On the other hand, you look at a connected vehicle, for instance, it is going to have a constant stream of communications going back and forth with very feature data rich requirements. So the technology and the spectrum, therefore, requirements uh, that apply to each of those two cases will be quite varied. So again, from a, there are a number of different um, requirements that apply with regards to what type of spectrum is used. And once that is determined, there are further uh, applications that apply. Just one minute, I might have missed this slide. No, that slide is coming up. Very good, I'll come to that. Give me the, to give an example of wireless networks. So this is mobile wireless services that uh, most everyone's familiar with, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, um, and the, the four mobile network operators, MNOs, that are currently uh, have licenses for across the whole country, apply countrywide. There is a push, however, as you go more and more local, you do not necessarily need coverage across the entire country. You just want coverage in your building or in your office park or in your warehouse, in your school campus and so forth. And so at that level, there are other options that apply with regards to more local networks that have more specific requirements and also do not need the, the, the geographical spread of the wider networks. And therefore, you can have a number of smaller local networks that can, inter can operate independently of each other. And that allows for each of those local networks can operate at the same frequency, but in a very localized geographical area, and therefore more reuse of wireless spectrum. And the, additionally, these networks are also can be set up individually. You do not need, for instance, to go to the likes of Vodafone to, to implement them. There are other solutions available. So to talk a bit about those solutions, um, and hopefully this isn't, this, this is a key diagram, which I'll try to explain a bit, uh, a bit further. So this represents uh, aspects, parts of the wireless spectrum, which is the electromagnetic spectrum that ranges from zero up to 300 gigahertz and beyond. And the wireless technologies that you and I all use, uh, use equipment that transmits and receives at different ranges within those frequencies. The typical one I think that we've all used is Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi operates in the 2.4 and 5 
and six nowadays lower six gigahertz range. And so equipment operates at that frequency, they communicate with each other. And that Wi-Fi is in that last box here, which is exempt and light licensing set of frequencies. And those frequencies have been assigned both internationally through international standards and agreements and specifically within the UK for use at a license exempt level, which means that you and I and anyone using Wi-Fi does not need to get a license, does not need to get permission because that frequency range that the equipment is operating in has been defined as license exempt and therefore opens up a very vast ecosystem of technologies that can be and, and enables businesses and, and services that can be spun up very, very quickly, very rapidly. Uh, there are other technologies operating in that range and license exempt. I mentioned Bluetooth earlier, LoRa, there's a number of these which all interwork with each other and have the property typically that they're quite polite. It's literally what we call polite protocol, which is that they won't, the idea is that services, once they start interfering with each other, that's a problem, once you have harmful interference. So there needs to be a mechanism, and this is where particular protocols come into play as to how these different devices um, and different technologies can operate, can coexist successfully. Some other technologies, um, such as, for instance, wireless, are need a bit more, um, are, are less polite in their protocol. There's more of a need to ensure that if the bandwidth is there, they will be there and their messages get through. And therefore, how those interoperate with some other systems is part of the calculations and analysis that my team within the engineering uh, group do. Um, there are, in between that range, some sharing um, licenses which we have developed and this is part of our mechanism to try to innovate and find new ways to make spectrum available uh, where we can actually make use of some of the frequencies that are in use um, for instance by the wireless MNOs at national level but overlay on top of those at a very local level without causing issues where there is limited mobile wireless coverage then there becomes a solution to have a local license in that particular geographical area to provide coverage or to provide local networks. Um, so there are different, all of these you can see along the top are different frequency ranges um, that apply that have been allocated either of licensed or license exempt capability. And associated with those are particular parameters to do with, for instance, the emission of power, the particular way your antenna beam shapes uh, and different capabilities to ensure that a whole equipment ecosystem can operate within that range successfully alongside other devices. So just to give a couple of examples of where this applies to, uh, to smart cities. Within smart cities, by definition, it's busy, it's built up, there are more devices and technologies trying to communicate in a closed geographical area. And therefore there are complexities that apply that wouldn't apply in less built up areas or in rural areas. Uh, you also have signals literally bounce off buildings. They interfere with each other. There are a, a number of different considerations that need to be taken into account. Uh, a lot of these can be modeled through sophisticated computer models and you've seen I can show you a couple outputs here on the graph um, of models that look to simulate you, you essentially implement on the computer a, a an antenna a, a number of antennas with particular radiating patterns and you simulate what that reception would be for uh, for devices um, that is then complemented with some measurements on the ground that we also conduct to see that what we've actually simulated is what actually um, gets reflected on the ground. So a couple of examples here are at the top are a, a 3D model because what the, the actual height dimension also counts, uh, is important. Um, and once you get into higher and higher frequencies, your span of action reduces because the higher frequency travels less far, but it carries more information. So you have this compromise between richness of information and how far it carries. 
the diagram on the left hand side is an example of uh, the shared licenses that I spoke about, where what you can see there is the dark blue blotch in the middle is essentially the reach of a single mask right in the middle, the purple the sort of red triangle you can kind of see just in the middle is a single mask and how it sends, how it covers, how it has coverage as you go out from there. And the reason it's not a perfect circle is because there is topography, buildings, other various obstacles in the way. That is one mass with medium power, so operating at quite a large stretch. Compare that with the other five light blue um, pa patterns that you can see, which are operating at lower power. So you end up, for instance, having considering trade-offs between a few smaller regions at low power versus one larger one at medium power. And those are the types of analysis and calculations that come into play when we look as to how we can most effectively share a spectrum um, for different uses and different uh, stakeholders. Um, a number of other factors that come into play. The diagram on the right hand side is um, uh, just a spectrum interference diagram where if you can see there's a kind of big wave at the back, which is a, a Wi-Fi signal. And then all the little dashes along the front are Bluetooth signals. So every time you walk around with your phone with a Bluetooth signal um, on, those spikes. And what happens is both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, which are in that license exempt spectrum that I mentioned, have protocols in how the, the signals are sent that effectively keep on looking out for each other and jumping out of the way, moving a little bit to the side, turning on and off very, very rapidly, so that the end result is that everybody can work together because it just switches on and off and moves around quite a lot and it, it, it effectively appears as one continuous flow for, for everyone. I'm very, I'm drastically simplifying here, but hopefully this gives a view of some of the complexities and the, um, the challenges that we see in terms of operating and how the solutions that we look to try to develop in that respect. And then finally, one last slide, which is um, to do with a couple of examples recently, but I thought that would be of, of interest. So on the left-hand side, very, very topical, this was the uh, last weekend, the coronation event, um, where you can, you can see, um, so a couple of examples. This one on the left-hand side is actually from uh, BBC. They uh, used, they set up a temporary network using a 5G slice um, of, the, of the network. And this is a new capability in 5G, where on a 5G standalone network, there can be a dedicated slice or just essentially a little sub network within the main network, um, which is dedicated to their use uh, and allows for great um, consistency and reliability of the signal. And I think this was actually the first public use of a 5G standalone <coughs> network slice um, for a big, big major event in the UK. So it worked and uh, it's, it's great to see that in implementation. And as you can see, the, that diagram on the bottom is, um, shows the mal, and the dark green spots are particular um, uh, antennas, you know, temporary cell sites, as you can see in the photograph that were mounted uh, ahead of time on the day and then provided the coverage and it's red, amber, green. So green is a very strong signal and then it goes down into amber, goes down into, into red. And this showed a nice, strong coverage line going towards um, Buckingham Palace. On the right hand side, my final point is, is a different implementation of uh, networking, which is for Sunderland, which has implemented a, which is very much leading the way uh, in some smart city deployments. They have uh, signed a partnership last year with BAI Communications, which is a uh, third party provider of networks um, for uh, providing a network within the city for use by uh, the, for the, the municipal services, for uh, they've extended that just recently to the university. They, um, they're providing free Wi-Fi in the city center uh, for all residents. So you can see the diagram on the bottom right. The blue dots are the, the initial uh, Wi-Fi setup that, that was enabled and they just announced that they're going to be extending it to the yellow, to the yellow zone so to expand that Wi-Fi service more broadly for use by the residents. Uh, and again, that is a good example of um, networking and making use of uh, connectivity of spectrum in support of smart cities. And again, 
Um, connectivity is, is one aspect of smart cities. Uh, it's been really interesting to hear in the course of the discussions today, the different elements that also come into play with regards to putting all the pieces of the puzzle together effectively and allowing for smart cities to, uh, to evolve. So that concludes my, um, my presentation. Happy to take any questions. our next speaker, uh, engineer Greg uh, Solveig. Uh, Greg is an AI sustainability researcher with BT Group, with more than nine years of experience working in geospatial data science and various roles. He now works uh, towards improving the sustainable and efficient operations of the BT network. He has developed a weather-based power map of cooling infrastructure on a national level and is working to incorporate this model in to a digital shadow of BT network. His work is focused on understanding and reducing energy use in telecommunications networks and modeling the system dynamics of large networks. So Greg has joined us online, so uh, I welcome Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and uh, for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, yeah, as, as said, I'll be discussing the BT network. Um, and the, a weather-based cooling model designed around the network. We, um, so, uh, sorry, the BT network is, is a huge network that spans England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's a, a big multinational organization and it's been running for decades. And any, any system that's been running for decades tends to uh, build up huge amounts of data. Uh, so we've been looking at the work we can we can use that data for. Uh, the BT network is a it's a vital service, uh, keeping people connected, not just families and friends, but also the police, fire, and ambulance. So it's it's hugely important that we keep those people able to talk to each other. Um, it is as a public service, it does have minimum service levels determined by the government. So we have. Uh, a requirement to make sure that we can run for up to seven days on our own backup power if something happens to the national grid. And this is a, a huge amount of energy required to do this. Uh, BT spends millions a day on electricity just to run the network. We currently use just just short of 1% of all electricity in the UK. Um, and the BT network is run entirely on green energy. So it's environmentally as gentle as it can be, but it's still a huge amount of green energy. And because the network uses so much of it, there's less green energy for the rest of the UK. Um, so as I said, we need to have up to seven days of backup energy supply for our exchange buildings uh, in the event of local power loss. And seven days of energy in Scotland in a rural exchange in winter is very different from seven days of energy in an urban exchange in London in the middle of summer. Uh, and uh, so we need to model our energy and understand what seven days looks like for each exchange. To do this, we've been looking at all of the data we've been collecting over the decades, and it's huge volumes of data, and it's all been collected for individual purposes. So it was never intended to be used for building uh, a network power model. Um, so we've been working to bring these together uh to try and use them to understand the network energy use as best we can 
it currently exists as an SQL database with multiple source feeds, thousands of different types of equipment in this model, more than 100 million individual equipment inventory records. Um, so we know each bit of network kit, uh, we know where it is, we know how many of them we have in each location, and we know how much energy they use under normal operating conditions. So once we had built all that into our model, we were able to explain about 70% of our network energy use, uh, which was good, but 30% uh, of unknown energy is, is still a significant amount. The rest of it was just labeled as overheads, uh, and we would get to it when we could. Over the last year, uh, we could. So we've been looking into those overheads and trying to reduce or control the, our energy use is getting easier now that we can account for so much of that energy use. Uh, we believed it was going to be significantly influenced by our cooling equipment. So we've got three different types of cooling equipment across the network, uh, and they all behave in different ways. So there's three different cooling types, which means three different cooling models. And to understand their energy use, we needed to understand local temperature of each of our exchanges on an hourly basis and then we could plot hourly energy use for each piece of equipment and then from there we could plot the energy use of each exchange building around our network so in the last few months we've been able to get our understanding of energy use to over 85 percent of our build energy is now explainable but because we've done these energy models and we've done the cooling models we can also model changes to the cooling infrastructure. So if we changed our cooling equipment, went to all one type of cooling, we could see how that would affect our energy use. We can also model how our energy use would be impacted by adjusting our set points. So the temperature that we cool our equipment to. If we, cool, if we allow the rooms to get a little bit warmer, we can see that we could save a significant amount of energy in our cooling equipment. And we have done that recently. We adjusted from 25 degrees up to 28 degrees in some of our rooms and saved significant amounts of energy. We did, however, notice that some of our other equipment started to increase its energy use around about the same time. Uh, we believe this is a result of the network kit uh, turning its fans higher to push the slightly warmer air away from itself. So we can see how much energy we're saving in the cooling equipment. We can see how much more energy we're using in the network equipment. So now it's a balancing act and we can start to model those things using the digital shadow of the network. We can see where the, the best balance is between reducing our cooling power and not overly increasing our network kit power. So we still have 10 to 15% of our energy that we still can't account for, um, which still leaves us with a, a significant chunk of energy. Uh, we believe some of it will be heating our exchanges. They do need to be heated as well because if it gets too cold, the network equipment will become brittle and start to snap. Uh, most of our heating is gas, so we don't think that explains everything. Uh, there's also people need to be explained. We have to accept that there's a level of uncertainty with people and their energy use and their behavior, and uh, we can never account for or understand all of it. As an example, we did an exchange visit not so long ago, and we found that there was no heating in the exchange. So when an engineer was visiting, he had turned on an oven in the kitchen and left the oven door open to use that as a heater while he was working in it. We can never see that in our data models. We just have to accept things like that are going to happen. Uh, there's also lightings, uh, elevators, security systems. We can add these and we are adding them when we can, but we'll never be able to keep up with people changing a light bulb, uh, that kind of thing. So at some point, you just have to accept you've modeled what you can and uh, you've understood as best you can. We're also doing other work to understand energy use and, and improve our carbon footprint. Uh, for instance, we're collaborating with the University of West London on using AI and machine learning to optimize 5G networks or to understand uh, where the, the point of best return is, how heavy of a touch of an AI, a machine learning package, uh, 
how best it optimizes the network and where it becomes inefficient because of the amount of energy used to train that model. Uh, so training in, on a network uh, requires it to see bad states as well as good states, and, and no one's going to want us to put the EE network into a bad state just to train a model. So we're making use of uh, simulations of local 5G networks, and, and we can simulate models using that and different scenarios and train models using that. But really, we want to see how much energy is used in training these models and if it provides a real benefit in real world terms. And ultimately, everything we're doing is working towards um, building a digital twin of our network. And what we can do with our digital twin when it's ready is um, feed it into something like the Credo project at the Climate Resilient Demonstrator. And that's a, a federated digital twin, which means it's our digital twin at BT and our network uh, combined with a UK power network digital twin and uh, a water company digital twin, Anglium Water in this case. And if one of us has experienced some sort of uh, climate change event, such as a, a flooding in part of our network, we'll be able to see how that will affect our um, colleagues over in the UK power network or in Anglian water. And equally, if a flood is affecting some of their equipment, they'll be able to let us know that we're going to lose power somewhere. And we can shift to backup power before we actually have any interruption of service. So we can understand how one impact, one impacted asset can spread to different agencies and we can start to prepare for these kinds of things. Where reaching a point now where we can predict based on weather forecasts how much energy we need to keep an exchange running for seven days on backup and one of the benefits of knowing how much energy we need to maintain that seven day backup reserve it means that we know how much extra energy we have stored in our buildings and the benefits of extra energy stored in the buildings means we could manage our risk of taking an exchange off the national grid and this would help the national grid in peak times if they're having a lot of energy use and they're running out of green energy we can switch to our backup reserves which we know have been uh, batteries will have been charged up using green energy so we're, we're happy to use that backup we'll take pressure off the national grid uh, effectively turning our exchange network into a virtual power plant um, and another benefit is because of our understanding of our cooling infrastructure we can increase the available bandwidth in our network while limiting the increase in energy use and this allows for uh, better network availability for iot devices and all the benefits that can bring and it also allows us to understand ev char um, electric vehicle charging infrastructure so we're switching our fleet of vans from diesel vans to electric vehicles and again knowing how much extra energy we have stored in our exchanges means we know we can charge our vans to the level they need to carry out their work for that day. So I guess all of this really serves to highlight how important good data is. Um, you've got to accept people are always going to be somewhat of an unknown. Um, you just got to account for what you know as best you can. Uh, George Box, a statistician, said all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So you just keep that in mind, except you'll never get a perfect model of a real world environment. But start simple, um, get the basics right, and you can build smaller pieces in over time, improve the models as you go. And AI and machine learning are hugely valuable tools in tackling uh, the problems posed by climate change, but they're, they're not the only solution and sometimes aren't even the best solution. Training these models can be so resource in intensive that it outweighs or drastically reduces the benefits that you can see from them. So pick your solutions carefully, and um, yeah, just understand your challenge and, and take the right approach to it. Uh, that's it from me. Thank you. Happy to take any questions.
So the next speaker is presented by Dr. Yana from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, Dr. Yana, the doctor of language. It's a great pleasure that I can introduce not just one but two speakers from the agency of Orlando. I'd like to start with uh, Christy Yu. Uh, Christy is an intelligent transport system engineer with over seven years of experience in the industry. Uh, Christy started her career in Europe, uh, an engineering consultancy firm, after graduating um, a master's degree in transport from the Imperial College. Uh, Christy's current role uh, involves implementing and upgrading transport technologies on modern roads and keeping modern moving. In the past years, she has contributed to a wide uh, variety of projects, um, just to mention a few. Uh, electrical vehicle on street charging on TFL, road network, TFL traffic signal, port reporting system, replacement of uh, thermal CCTV cameras, national highways, travel demand management, all very complicated for me. Uh, or uh, free flow charging in Hong Kong and major international airport drop off charging system. The second speaker uh, is Jane Wright, uh, who is a systems engineer uh, leading the development of carbon capability in transport for London's engineering and capital programs directorate and uh, supports the development of TFL's zero emission bus strategy. Uh, Jane is an ICE uh, carbon champion and was named one of the Women's Engineering Society's top 50 women engineers in 2022. Please welcome uh, Christy and Jane. So wherever we come from, 
uh, what are we doing now in terms of interconnected cities and, and where are we trying to go to in the future? Um, so I'm not going to step through the whole of TFR's quick history because it's sort of coming up to, to 200 years old. Um, but you know, we've, we've got a really big history of, of making London an interconnected city and lots of people will argue that Transport for London is London in lots of ways um, and not just people who are at TFL. Um, so the picture on the top left is King's Cross being at the station being built in 1861, so a cut and cover station, which is um, um, and also a street station in the bottom right. The design proposal, but you'll probably recognise those of you who know the station quite well, um, the, the the archways within the tunnel itself. Um, and so all of this work really requires good connection and, and interconnectivity um, between the highways world and the developing railways world and so that was just the start of, of TFL's impact on the city in connection to, to the existing infrastructure. The electric work railway then came sort of 30 years later uh, within the modern lines so this was the first electric railway before this we've had lots of steam railways um, and really started the advent of TFL's and London Underground's connection to not just itself as a transport network but to other utilities crucially electricity. Um, and today we are now um, London's biggest consumer of electricity, about 1.3 terawatt hours a year. So like BT, we've got quite a big um, electricity um, uh, bill. And, and this is only going to grow with the advent of electric buses. Um, so more of that's coming up. Um, and this is where we are today. We're Transport for London. We've got all of those modes up on board. So there's a lot that we do and there are a lot of interconnections. Um, and we have a really, uh, we have the really big potential to really influence London and create a interconnected smart city going forward. So where we are today, um, top 10 recognisable brands in the world currently. We've got 8,600 buses, and um, you know lots of people think that the London Underground is the is London's sort of flagship transport um, uh, mode, but actually buses carry more people in London than the tube does every day. Um, we've got lots of staff, lots of bus stops, um, lots of tube stations, um, so it's a really big part of London. And we're trying to, to, to get better every day. So our purpose is to move London forward safely, inclusively and sustainably. We want to be a strong green heartbeat for London um, and our values are to be carried open and adaptable. Um, so our three of our, our core pillars at TFL our society, environment, and economy, and really it's, it's bringing those links together. We're not just standalone transport, we want to make sure that we're developing uh, London as a whole sustainably. And so this just tries to show how complicated an organisation we are and how we're trying to make sure that we're leveraging those, those interconnections between different assets um, and different networks. Um, so between ourselves, all of our different ground also all of our different modes, and there are lots of connections here. So we've got lots of places where the London Underground interfaces with the London Overground and Elizabeth Line um, and DLR2. Our buses and all of our bus stands need to be well um, interfaced with our, our street network, with trams and with taxis and cycle hire um, systems as well that people have mentioned. Um, but we also have external interfaces too. Um, crucially, UK power networks, which have been mentioned again today, so providing um, that uh, power distribution to London Underground, but also our other partners as well. So, Network Rail, we interface a lot with them, National Grid, of course, um, and crucially um, and uh, uh, more frequently nowadays is, is communication systems as well. So, me and Kirsty are going to, Christy are going to talk through um, some of the areas where we. we Connect here and starting with contactless in Oyster because I think that's, that's one of the biggest success stories for TFL in terms of connectivity. Um, so, Oyster uh, this year was actually the 20th anniversary of Oyster. Um, so, 2006, it made up only 10% sort of, of fares, and, and only within sort of, three years, um, Oyster payments became 80% sort of, of fares. But even you know, as, as that success story, and you know, over only really three, four launch periods, our tech and data team were already thinking about okay, what's the next step in connectivity? How do we move from something where you know we get the convenience of Oyster, but without the need for people to, to buy TFL's money in some ways to be able to, to use our transport network? Um, and really, our tech and data team are really proud to, to have been uh, some of the first. Um, organisations to bring in contactless payments. Uh, we now get 
100,000 new contact list cards per day, um, and all of this means that we're able to save um, £400 million pounds, um, per year um, on our revenue collection system based uh, compared to what we used to do with, with our certificate system. So using connected technologies and leveraging connections with other organisations and banking sector, um, we've been able to reduce the amount of money that we spend on collecting our fares from 15% um, back in about 2006 to now that being 9% um, of fares instead. So in this thing I've talked about um, things that we might not have noticed on the road that we see every day, uh, which is the account center. So as you can see, uh, the middle diagram right there, this is like a normal road that you would normally see. So, but occasionally you will see something on the bottom right of the picture where like the road seems to be being slide uh, open. So once that uh, there are a couple lines, I think if you remember from maybe GCSE in level, we learned about right hand routes where there is like motion, magnetic field, and current. So obviously when a, when a car passed by, which it, which um, the, it generated the magnetic field with the copper wire on the ground, so it sent out a signal um, to the uh, to the it's not only uh, about the traffic signal where it does receive like. Um, Signal saying, oh, there's a car there, right there, or how fast is it? Or it could be there would be a queue on the road, and they say, like, oh, there's a car stopping right there. So there's a long queue, we should um, change the track, uh, change the traffic lights, uh, change the color of the green, so we let them go. So, how does it all work? Is um, you can see a lot of like metal cabinet on, on, the, uh, on the road. So, if you open it up, this is where what you're going to see. There's a lot of cable there. You, you can imagine it as like a mini computer where it will gather all the data from the road as well as if there's a pedestrian who press the button, it will send, it, send a signal to the mini computers, we call it a traffic controller, where it kind of uh, control the traffic light. Um, the model that running the traffic controller is called a scoot system, which is fooling with a split cycle box set optimization panic, so basically gather information and make a better decision of when to change the green light. Um, and all that information is actually sent to a uh, data center, uh, as well as uh, you can see the um, control center within TFL. Um, so anyone wants to show up and how many traffic signals are there in London? If you think it's a thousand, raise your hand. Two thousand? Three thousand. Yeah. So now it's like around three thousand of them. We're not talking about like each single light, but like a whole junction. So there's like three thousand of them. Um, apart from that, so the uh, control center also uh, also look at the CCTV camera, monitoring the road network. For example, if there's a black wall tunnel. Uh, all of a sudden, there's smoke coming out. Uh, it's unsafe for you, so the traffic controller would need to kind of shut down the tunnel and then show uh, show people a diversion. Uh, so normally, you will see something called variable message line, which shows you like, oh, how long does it take to a certain place, or the, the for, uh, for example, black work tunnel is closed. There's where is the next um, uh, where's the next diversion point that you can do to get to where you want to go. So we're now going to go around talking about what's happening after what we have. Right, so this is uh, um, So imagine the scoop system that I mentioned. They are actually 30 years old. They were developed in the 80s. So the how people travel changes all the time. So 30 years ago, there's no cycling, there's no cycle highways, um, but now there are all these new components that's coming up uh, on the road. So the uh, so at the moment, TSL is doing a um, new modeling called with a real time optimizer. So it helps to have uh, understand the road better and make better decision. So at the top. Uh, right, uh, you can see two pictures, which is rather than having uh, pedestrians to press the button to tell the traffic controller that 
we are there. And there is some um, uses to so kind of like camera to kind of you can see the numbers, there, which means like how long they have been waiting at the light. And then at the bottom, uh, it's just using CCTV camera as well with video analytic capability, uh, where we analyze oh, how many pedestrians are there uh, in the previous slide. Talk about all the loops and stuff. So it can only detect like metal, obviously. But now, uh, with, the, with the video analytic capability, we can detect cyclists. Uh, pedestrians, so we have a better understanding of who is using uh, roads in London. Uh, and, and that way we can help, uh, we can collect more data, which hopefully help us to make a better decision of how we could uh, change the design of different streets in the future. Um, this is just a quick one through of the project that is about connected corridor. So this project is about um, uh, you, it's, a, it's about uh, how we can use connected corridor all the way from London, um, all the way down to France. So these are all the partners that have been working on this project. So there are four C uh, connected ITS services that I'm going to mention it in the next few slides. So don't worry too much about it right now. So when you think about uh, autonomous vehicle, uh, we talk about it all the time, but when you think about it, um, yeah, a little bit more. You actually need to think about how information are being exchanged. Um, if you think about how does the car know that the green light will happen in 20 seconds? Um, all that questions that we need to think about. So this project uh, gives us an idea of how, ex how the infrastructure can actually be smart as well so they can communicate with the cars. So this is in this pilot project. This is the section that TFL has been testing. So if, it, uh, if you imagine like there's a car driving on the from the bottom right up to uh, Greenbridge, um, this is all the all the like the testing that we have done. As I mentioned, there's four CITS services. The first one is in feed for signaling. So how do we replicate all the signal that's on the road into the car? And then the second one is how do we the pro vehicle data, how do we make sure the vehicle data is actually being transferred, uh, being transferred into the infrastructure or the roadside uh, furniture to make to make communication. The third one is the road work warning. So that's like, for example, the road work is normally temporary. So how can we notify the driver there is a road work uh, coming up soon? So this is the way you And then the last one is the green light optimized speed advice. So let's say when we're driving a car, uh, if we know that the green light is going to be in five seconds and we're maybe like just a, just a few seconds um, uh, behind the light, we don't need to break right of a sudden when the, when the red light comes up. So we can like kind of uh, go through the green light at normal speed within the speed limit. So yeah, great, uh, and it's a great success. So looking forward to know how, um, how what's the next step is, and how that would apply to the general smart city, uh, connected city kind of thing. Cool. So um, uh, it's slightly different approach, and sort of taking back up the high level is, is you know, what are Transport for London's opportunities uh, to support connected and and um, systems approaches to, to city design um, based on, on where we are now and what do we need to do in the future to, to further connect our of physical assets, not just from a communications perspective, but from a more physical asset perspective. Um, so with, with um, Transport for London and my focus, it's a lot around decarbonisation and so we have to filter back to the UK's net zero um, targets and requirements. Um, so of course we know as planet Earth we need to be decarbonising. Uh, we know that as a country we need to as well. London now has um, targets to get to net zero by 2030 based on its operational fuels and energy use um, and that then trickles down to transport for London as well. So we very much operate within um, this system and we operate assets within this system as well. We really need to be taking a systems approach um, to decarbonisation and making sure we're drawing out those connections and leveraging them to make good policy decisions. Um, so there's been lots of um, letters to government, 
um, and papers put out by the government itself, really to demonstrate um, and uh, showing that what we need to do is make sure we are taking a system approach to net zero. This meaning we're not just considering transport in isolation, but we're drawing together power, utilities, water, very much um, what, what BC, uh, Brett from BC was saying earlier, we need to make sure we're, we're pulling together um, the, the opportunity to, to link up our assets as much as possible to, in order to make the right decisions to get to net zero. Transport for London at the moment, this is, this is a very basic diagram of, of how we interface with UK power networks and our power distribution systems. Um, so we have UK power networks distribution network in, in London. Um, that then interfaces with London Underground's power, uh, private power network. So, so largest electricity consumer in London and also uh, the largest private power uh, network in London. Uh, Heathrow also have their own, I'm sure there are others around the city who have their own private networks too. Um, separately, we then are increasingly having power connections into bus garages to accelerate bus electrification. So we have the target to get to um, a fully electric bus fleet by 2034. Hopefully we can, we can bring that, um, that date forward sooner. Huge challenges around getting huge amounts of power into bus garages. Um, what's worth pointing out is that a um, a new substation and lots of primary substation upgrades are usually required after about 250 um, kilowatts of power uh, demand. Um, in garages, we're putting in megawatts of power, so four or five meg uh, megawatts typically per garage. And um, a typical housing estate usually puts in about a small substation of about 250 kilowatts. So with electrifying the bus fleet in London, that's basically equivalent to saying we are building, you know, the equivalent of hundreds of new housing estates across London in terms of the power uh, requirements that we need. So, so a really, really big undertaking. And then finally, with uh, renewable energy generation, we're looking to see what we can do to leverage um, renewables, of course. We've got targets in London for how much solar we need to, to build across our estates. Um, and that's only going to wrap up over the next few years. But as you can see, you know, we've got really different organisations or entities who all interface with um, UK power networks. And what we really need to be doing is getting to a point where we are um, increasing those connections to maximise efficiencies. We should be looking into how we can connect up solar direct into our private power network um, to make sure that, that we have flexibility in demand management when it comes to renewable generation. Um, and crucially, and something that I'm working on in the next few months, is seeing whether we can start to connect up bus garages directly to London Underground's power network again. So we're not just drawing through all of our power through the five volts, five points that we get from UKPN, but actually we have more flexibility in pushing our power, regenerative braking, renewables around our network, and buses are a way to support that. It's a really clear um, and um, there are good opportunities in this connection as well, not just, just from the, the sort of power management perspective for UKPN, um, but buses predominantly charge overnight and our trains are usually in the depot overnight. So we have this uh, lovely situation where we get peak power demand for buses overnight and peak power demands for the trains during the day. So this sort of more interconnected world, this um, systems approach to, to design and you know you can widen this out, this is just connections. UK uh, power networks. I'm sure there are lots of opportunities that we could be talking more to, to BT and, and um, uh, more of our utilities partners to the water sector as well to make sure we're, we're leveraging and making efficient cities where we can. Um, so just to end, you know, who, who's going to make this all happen? Um, I think we've had lots of really good talks from engineers today and, and it's all going to be engineers, um, which is, you know, really very exciting. I think both me and Christy really like our jobs, I hope, I don't know, speaking, <laughs> speaking on Christmas behalf. Um, but, you know, we get to work every day with, with lots of cool people and lots of multidisciplinary projects. And hopefully when we move towards an interconnected smart city, we get to, to work together more as, as engineers in, in different disciplines more and more going forward. Um, happy to take any questions.
Um, so it's it's an evolving picture at the moment. So we've, we've currently got um, about 10% of our bus fleets are zero emission. So predominantly electric buses, and then we have 20 double deck hydrogen buses which are on trial. Um, the issue at the moment, it, you know, it all comes down to what's the customer experience, but also what, what are the costs to, to TFL of, of that technology. And at the moment, hydrogen is is just very it's, it's more costly from a whole life perspective than than battery electric. Uh, the main issue at the moment is also security of supply. Um, we we've had issues with getting hydrogen supply where where we haven't had the refueling station. Um, the refueling station hasn't had a delivery of hydrogen in in sort of weeks. Um, so getting to a point where we've got that robust supply chain is, is a real challenge at the moment, and it's not just a challenge for us; it's a challenge for anyone at the moment trying to use hydrogen. So it's it's not never say never at the moment. At the moment, we see battery electric vehicles um, covering at least sort of eighty percent of of our routes and our needs. We've got that top sort of twenty percent, which are really high mileage routes, which are really challenging, and we've got to work out what additional on route charging do we need for, for those battery electric buses or do we need to put in hydrogen instead so yeah still still working through that so the question that i have is um the way i see it is transport is not just a bit of knowledge and um, for example it's much cheaper to drive than to use the Taking the tube is cheaper than taking your share bus to go to work. And I'm not saying that we should make cars more expensive. I'm saying we should make the alternative of what we want people to be less expensive. And it's not the case. So the way I see it is technology is definitely an important aspect, but it has to go together with policy, with regulation, with pricing. And I was wondering how is it that you approach this kind of multi aspect. No, it's hard. Um, I think you, you probably mentioned it like at the start, you know, you've, you've at the moment the car is a very attractive option. Um, and, you know, some say at the moment public transport can't compete. I think we need to be challenging ourselves as a, as a transport authority to say, you know, coming back. So I hope you'll be able to forget to do the survey. Uh, now it's time for the panel discussion. Uh, working together to create inclusive smart cities. Um, okay. Hello everyone, my name is Nora and I'm currently a PhD student in electronic and electrical engineering at UCL. And I'm also an ambassador to the IEEE board in engineering. Um, so I joined one of the events last year and I got pretty excited to meet lots of people. And um, it's really nice to see how many people are passionate about putting more women in engineering and giving women a shot, which is amazing. And I thought uh, maybe in this uh, panel discussion, we can talk more about the topic on smart cities. As uh, we strive to create cities that are smarter, more sustainable, and more inclusive, it is essential that we work together to achieve this goal. Uh, so we have. I was going to introduce you guys. I'm going to say, but you guys are already <laughs> here, which is great. <laughs> um, so maybe we can take some questions from the audience. Uh, so feel free to ask anything that comes up to mind. I can just get into it. Okay. okay. Yeah. So my first question is, you want to introduce yourself? Oh, I'm Casey. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, my first question is, AI is amazing and it's being used constantly, whether or not it's in TFL, in different systems and tasks that work that might be. Do you think that companies now are getting into AI to increase their efficiency, or is it because they think they're missing something in their actual industry? So for example, with, with TFL, are they doing it to try and reduce the amount of waste, especially with the companies that work personally with it a little bit, and it's a huge industry, or are they just 
what are some of the challenges which are still still to be solved or tackled potentially by AI or an AI system. Um, we've got an open innovation team at the moment who are working with Google and I can't remember a couple other um, organisations at the moment to, to see and um, start to identify what might be the opportunities for AI at that transport for London. But it's sort of early days and it's 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 going to be difficult. And I think it's as the others have said, it's identifying that suitable use case when you get that that bank, but that that value out which is where AI is, is going to take off. Um, I think unfortunately at the moment transport for London doesn't have enough money just to have AI for the sake of AI. So so yeah, it's going to take us a bit of time to to get there. But everything's moving so quickly and there are really exciting use cases. So hopefully that will just grow and grow and we'll get to the point where we can use it to, to make transport. Thank you. So, do you guys have more questions? Um, hello, uh, I'm Dr. Salmi Alevi. Uh, my question is uh, we can see from your um, talk that you are all veterans in the field, even though you are all here under the same title. Uh, all of you have were talking like different different things that you are working on. So um, based on that, what is if I may ask? It might be a bit of a cliche question or maybe a regular question that you might face. What is the biggest challenge that you faced in your work slash research? If you may I'd like to share with us, please. Yeah. Um, so I think like the uh, biggest challenge um, of joining CFL for a year is, is as um, she just said, it's a very big organization, um, and there is a lot of legacy around it, around like many different things. For example, there could be a camera that could be from the 80s, and, like all that. Um, like you can imagine, like the quality, like the communication, as in like different standards, like how. You, for example, you configure a camera. How could you talk to another camera? Um, all that uh, kind of how you line it up, making sure all the cameras talk in the same language. Um, I think that's um, at the moment it's one of the big challenges that I have. I think hopefully in the future we have everything kind of uh, understand, have the same language, to speak the same language. Uh, for example, the digital twins, all that. Speak the same language, information can transfer from one to the other very easily across different industries. For example, we've got uh, medication, let's say, with um, um, hospital. For example, they know that there is, um, maybe there is a congestion somewhere down the road. They know that the patient will be late. Um, and then they can tell the hospital or the doctor, say, oh, maybe they can treat someone else less, something like that. So, yeah, that that would be great to see in the future how things would be integrated similarly. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think being researching university, we have a lot of challenges. <laughs> One thing. <laughs> One thing. <laughs> but like sort of trying to understand what our priorities. Where the future coming and where emerging, I think it becomes more important because everything you're doing, if you see what will happen in four or five years' time, you are ahead of everyone. And if you're ahead of everyone, you suddenly start to think about solutions five years earlier than anyone else just thought about this. And uh, as a result, uh, you sort of know a bit more and thoughtful more about it. And I think for us as a, uh, in academia, challenge is to recognize what industries needs will be in a couple of years' time. And ChatGPT does not allow us to do this, so for us, so it's basically, it accelerates faster than what we can do, for example. I'm sure many of you have seen it with uh, thousands of papers published within the period of six months, which I have, we have never seen any of speed of acceleration. And if you will learn all this, how to do this, and how to match and get this vision and get it together, so it's suddenly what you're working now makes sense and become useful for any of industries and research as it comes. So for me, I'll give 
three, but I'm going to come words in each. So, first of all, to the point that Sylvia said, is integration and interoperability, specifically around data. And it's always a headache as to what form and take they're arriving. Um, the worst one I've ever had was a photo of a PDF, and they couldn't take the photo straight. <laughs> So, and there was a table of data on that. How am I supposed to work with that? So that integration interoperability at that level, and that is not a couple. The second one is diverse and inclusive design for all stakeholders. So, for example, at the moment we're working with Brentford City Council and we're saying how do we let the market stores access the data that tells them what time they show up in their store because this is the time that people are getting off the buses. And if they were to open an hour earlier, that might mean they double their revenue. But as a business, they only still accept cash payment. So they are as far removed from digital and tech as you can imagine. But the transformation, if they were to make that leap, can be completely transformation for those business. And following from that, as a business owner and business leader, it is comes down to this point around which you're alluding to is how do we take these concepts of innovation and actually take them to the right stakeholders so that there are stakeholders willing to pay as a business, I need to pay my staff, particularly as a startup. But how do we accelerate that, particularly when we're talking to government, we're talking to local councils, things like in three, four, five years' time, and it takes that time to build it, but it's not a problem for them today. But if they don't spend the money now, it will be a problem for them tomorrow. So that is a fun navigation. So I'm always trying to think about who do I need to talk to, who do I need to reach to, and what's the story as part of it. Thank you. Again, I'm, I'm finding it very interesting in this whole day to pick up on the recurring themes, and this is very much an instance here because a couple of points I would make have already been made. One is around Importance of involving all stakeholders, and, and by stakeholders is anyone who literally has a stake in what you're doing, and that is important because otherwise you will be um, favoring certain groups at the expense of others. You need to take that rounded view and get the inputs from uh, all different stakeholders, which isn't to say, by the way, that you can find a solution that makes everyone happy. That that doesn't generally exist, um, but you need to have considered it in the round and understood the pros and cons and, and assess that, and that is really a key consideration. Um, another one on the same basis is um, what we tend to call the corner cases, which is if we're, if we're assessing uh, potential new technology or new capabilities, new parameters, you consider the scenarios of how they're going to be used now, but also 5, 10, 20 years in the future, and the, you know, we have 85, 95% of the time this will happen, or you expect this will happen, but what about the final 5%? Can that be considered? How do you understand the parameters around that because what is right now your five percent instance could grow to become 25 or 30 percent in even three years time and how is that taken into consideration so it's around that projecting forward into the future to have that, that forward view um, and under accepting as well that there are things that, that you know what you won't have predicted something brand new will come out and, and how do you deal with it what are the, the mechanisms to to picking up on that so uh, I think those are the, the challenges. The other element I would say is around proportionality. So there's a whole world of things, there's a huge range, and it goes back to the prioritization. You've got to be, you know, you've got to be um, pragmatic actually around how much work you can do on something because you could investigate and analyze something endlessly and, and then you have no time to investigate and analyze the other things. So it's around having that balance. Thank you. <laughs> we have another one. Um, so yes, I have actually two questions, and it's related to probably what you've said jointly. Um, AI can't be the solution for everything, and we often throw AI at the problem. Um, and I was reading this uh, article yesterday that want to train one AI model to transform that. Would create CO2 emissions as much as five cars per 
through the walls and that. And, um, and that, that means to think, so to solve energy efficiency by AI, uh, what's the balance, where do we stop? And how can we make the models, of course, require less data as you've done, and this, this is impressive, but it's about what is the right data to include, and it can't be always the same answer, it's got to be related to the context that we're dealing with. Um, but then, how can we create models that can be reused and uh, export from one application to another to avoid retraining all over again and avoid that massive student footprint um, that is connected with it? So, yes, we don't have, um, also, in the we don't have access to these massive GPUs by the industry. Does, but maybe it's a good thing, because as you say, it will push us to come up with something. More innovative and hopefully better for the environment. So, how, how do we go about that? And how do we compete with those who have the money? So, <coughs> they are <coughs> um, I think it's, it's slightly different perspective, but from a sort of like client organization a perspective where we have assets that we manage and, and looking at energy efficiency, I'm, uh, maybe it's just my personal perspective, but I'm on a bit of a crusade within our organizations. Similar to Tatiana, uh, to, to not have all the focus on having data and having the exact perfect answer, and, you know, the, the highest possible accuracy you can have in, in data and models before you make a decision. Um, so, you know, in my world, environment, thinking about climate change, where we know we don't have much time to act, you, you get a, a situation where at the moment, you know, there's increasing focus on climate change, which is great, but a lot of people say, we can't make a decision yet on what to do because we don't have all of the data we need. The data is not mature, the data is not consistent. Um, and so I'm having to have a lot of conversations with people at the moment about you know, what is the right level of maturity and saying, you know, we, we've got enough now to, to know we can take action and what action we can take and roughly what's going to make the biggest impact. So in energy efficiency, you know, we, we have really poor metering data at the moment. Um, and it's probably not good enough at all to make anything close for an energy model, let alone uh, get AI to help us out with the problem. But we, we know enough to be able to say, this is where we should be making the intervention. Um, this particular solution we know will cover you know, and help address 50% you know, of our energy consumption. And for now, that is enough. So I think there's definitely a conversation around what can you do now while you're trying to get that, that increased level of granularity of information and making sure people don't lose sight of that and just focus on the data part because the data is action. It's, it's, you're not going to get anywhere with just the data on its own. Uh, there is no such thing that I have a magic tool and can give a solution for any problem. And I think it never exists and it will never exist. Definitely. So that's why we need to be a very clever of a way how we should use our resources, what we have, and what we learn to make sure we have the The AI allows us to do operational research and strategic planning, for example. Uh, machine learning you can enable because it's so easy now to use that you don't need to get all these problem difficult skills to get around. So we should become more enabler than anything else. But in order to get to the next step when we start to look on the values, everyone forget that you will never you will always not have enough of data varieties. At the moment, everyone has massive amount of data. We are sitting literally on gold sand nowadays, which we don't realize. Imagine researchers who were doing the same research 10 years ago. And where it was not enough, and we are speaking now about not gigabytes of the data that shown from much, we are speaking about terabytes of information, and it's not enough. I think it's in our human nature not being fair enough. And at the same time, I think I'm in a bit more tricky position because if we want to work with companies, can I just ask David, if you work with a very large company as Microsoft, on their program, with their data, what is likely to you will share with me their real information about their revenue streams? What information? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Okay? And I think everyone's touch keeps forgetting that what brings AI models very efficient is not actual real data that you are giving, but the dynamics one. But at the same time, if I'll come back to David, say, listen, David, I understand, will never ever give me Microsoft data. Can you please create for me a data set that is will keep dynamics of the data? And I will tell you what it is. I had an experiment a couple of years ago. I got uh, finally project students come to me. And what I did, I gave him a um, data sheet of sensor data. And I said, listen, I want you to apply machine learning and classify. It took him like three months chasing me and telling me, what is the data? What are we needing? Can you tell me? I said, no, we do this. We will implement the system. And now we will have a look if you could beat results. By doing the clients, and when I told him what it was, he reached the sensor data. He learned how to work with synthetic data or blind data without understanding the meaning, but at the same time, bring it the value in. So now, when I'm giving him data, he asks less questions, design very quickly, and once he designs to the level of quality, people suddenly start to talk. <laughs> so I think we need to change the way how we use it, because as researchers, I don't see how we will be able to touch any of the large data unless we will sign privacy agreements. And once you say, sign privacy agreements, you're going to publish. This is what I have in my case. Like you will see my, some of my publications are like low because this is what they are working on. So you, you have your title. But being a bit more creative and still working with real data, but not being able to replicate and using dynamics, it gives you completely. Well, tell me if I'm wrong, I haven't seen any papers saying that it's basically, it's not about what the data I about, but about the dynamics of the value. I guess it's in hard way, but it's not. agree with everything you said so far, but I'll take a kind of different points on, on that. I think one of the key things that's alluded to in the first answer is actually the speed to value. So one of the reasons we end up with so much data is because we're we'll waiting to collect it out. So we need to get three years worth of data to see what happens over time. And it's like actually anything that the is for us is that data that we is meaningless because the world's changed. So the key question for me and for a lot of projects we work on is how quickly can we start rolling things out in an iterative way so that we start with the minimal amount that we can get away with and then we'll get away with that the world isn't behaving the way we thought it was. Why? What extra piece do we maybe need to fill out? But that means you don't end up collecting any more than you need. And you see, actually, that then wasn't relevant, so let's not collect any more of it. So it gives a very easy way to manage how much not to put out the situation. And the point that's mentioned about synthetic data is also, and then we see from the NHS, and you're doing a lot of work around synthetic data to try and make that available for pharmaceutical research. Really, now that's all about not sharing personal data, but it's very helpful because otherwise we end up doing clinical trials that take decades to collect new data. So it's speeding up that process as well. And that is a huge amount of data to store there. So that sharing of it in synthesized ways is another big part of it. The other side to that to help with that is something that um, we started alongside IBM and Dell was a responsible computing consortium to allow us to collaborate around some of these things to break down some of the barriers. So, right, I mean, what are you doing? Dell, what are you doing about the hardware? How are you actually doing this? And getting in a safe space where we actually agree the terms and conditions of how we will share data, what data we will share, bringing in academics and actually creating those consortia to collaborate around some of those key challenges. Because not one of us has the answer. We have to collaborate. Key point drawn out, and to which I would add to the notion of incremental this idea of having milestones and having, you know, going in steps and, and seeing at each point where you're at, what conclusions you can draw, and then potentially adjusting um, where, where you're at and whether the different parameters that come into play. And, and go back to the uh, quote that I think uh, Greg has already uh, had about there not being a perfect model, and there isn't, and uh, you know, all of these are models, and all of these are only ever approximations, and you have to. Work, work with that and a good example of what we see in our context is where we have a number of very complex 
um, software tools that, that simulate um, that simulate uh, Spectrum, spectrum rate met electromagnetic waves, and uh, I can guarantee you for any kind of given instance, I can go to my, my field team who will point, in, point the measuring apparatus and measure something that shouldn't be there. You shouldn't see this, but you're still seeing it. Um, so you do have you know, what the models say and you work to the models, but you have to also be conscious that that isn't the, the be all and the end all. Where that does somewhat break down is that where you can't you cannot confirm the negative, you cannot confirm the absence of something. You can always say, oh, I'm detecting something that I really shouldn't have, that's all that's <coughs> value. And that gives a very useful data set. What you don't, what you're not able by definition to measure is the absence of something. So that's just also something to, to bear in mind as well. Thanks. I'm not thinking so much for the brilliant talks and also the discussion. It's been very, very useful for me and actually for the older things. So, my question is about inclusive smart city. So, how do you imagine, uh, based on your background, based on your field, how do you imagine inclusive smart city? If you allow me, I'd like to welcome uh, the MBE, Betty Bonnard, uh, Israel, uh, CEO and founder of Farmer Charlie. And I'd like to start, if you don't mind, asking her this question and then we'll pass it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think in terms of inclusion, uh, the way you approach smart city is actually to open it. Um, and actually what we're doing in farming, you know, we're trying to put farming at the heart of the city, not in medical farms, but in people's rooftops and other places to make it accessible and uh, cut down some of the supply chain, for instance. So I, I think it's just trying to address a wide variety of needs where they are. And, and I think when we discuss AI, one of the important aspects that is wonderful to see so many women in different profiles, academia, industry, and etc. But it's exactly that is that when you talk data, it's only valuable when you have that kind of representativeness of the data. And if it's only designed by one group of people, you will have something that is going to be missed. So trying to make sure that that representative representation of what you try to achieve is done through data processes um, is critical. So um, two things I think I could mention is that there is a bridge AI call from Innovate UK that maybe people in the audience are interested to. I think it's an important thing that is happening. Uh, the second thing is that the International Telecommunications Union have a large group on the technical sector on smart cities and they're doing that from a UN perspective, so trying to develop that on a world level. And the UK has been quite a leading country in working on smart cities and I went to Taiwan. Um, a month ago, uh, talking about what I'm doing, doing farming, but with also other startups uh, interested in smart cities, and there's so much to learn across the border what some other countries are doing. So, um, I suppose from academia and from industry and from wherever you are, you need to look at what is happening elsewhere to be able to be inclusive. I'm sure the panel will have other views. Yeah, uh, on the the whole uh, conversation around inclusive design, I'm really interested in it's it's really fundamental um, to getting to net zero in cities and across the world, particularly from a specific uh, perspective of transport. Um, so you know, we talk a lot of transport for London about improving access to travel, getting more people onto public transport, um, and you can't do that if we don't have an inclusive network which works for for everyone. Um, and so it's, it's really important for us to make sure we bring all stakeholders onto the journey when we're designing our customer experiences, that we're not leaving groups out, um, to make sure we, we get to a point where we are creating an offering, which is a real alternative to the car. And in a lot of cases, it's, it's those diverse groups who need to rely more on a car as opposed to being able to, to, um, uh, to, to walk or, or cycle or use the tube in a lot of cases where we just don't have lifts and escalators because we age our network. So it's, it's a real challenge for us and something which we need 
to get really good at. Um, one of the, um, an example of, of kind of inclusive design, inclusive thinking, which really uh, strikes me, and uh, I, I really like the example, is one of the engineers in our organization. He does a lot of set out, really shows into a lot of primary schools to talk about engineering. Um, and one of the exercises he does is, is ask the kids um, to uh, draw, you know, what, what would, how would they design a bus? If they were an engineer um, and they wanted to design a double net bus, what would they do? And obviously, you know, it's a great activity for kids and also gets them thinking about some of the different systems on a bus. Um, and as he was walking around the classroom, one of the examples that he, he saw was, was a, a sort of pair of kids had been drawn a double deck bus with a lift in it. Um, as an engineer, you probably go, well, well, I don't know about that, but that's, that's really, you know, really sweet they've done that, you know, can't see how we're going to get a lift in a bus, but, you know, that's a fun idea. Somebody asked, you know, oh, why, why are you drawing, drawing a lift in a bus? And they said, because, you know, one of their classmates um, uh, is in a wheelchair, and they would like her to be able to, to go up to the, and ride on the top deck of the bus and, you know, get that better view that you get at the top of the bus. Um, I think that's, that's amazing, you know, um, you, uh, a lot of the time we, we don't necessarily really think about design which is inclusive and, and equal, not just, you know, being able to get onto the bus, but actually have that same level of experience. And I think that's what certainly as TFL and, you know, lots of other client organisations who are designing customer experiences, that's what we really need to get to if, if we're going to get uh, all the good social and environment outcomes that we need to out of um, um, I just wanted to add one of the example of the recent project that I worked on as well, where you think about on street electrical vehicle charge point, like you think about normally like the rapid and ultra rapid charge point, the cable are very heavy. So um, there was a workshop with um, ESI, uh, they recently published a, a like a standard about how had a recommendation on, around how to design an electrical vehicle charge point. We talk about like, all the drop cut, like in, you can imagine like most of the time the charge point stuff that's on the pavement. And then if you have a wheelchair, how are you gonna go down to the level state level of cop and plug it in? And at the same time, you need to control where your view is going. And then one hand of that very heavy cable. So all of those have been uh, thought about, think about how so in the um, hopefully in the next uh, generation of uh, charge point, we'll design all the features in there to include the that we can use uh, on the infrastructure that's on the street. Yeah. Um, interestingly, just before this, uh, this uh, session, we just had a conversation saying that uh, we are getting through the era where uh, it's, not, it's not going to be any more electrical engineering or computer science. Engineer, not because uh, these uh, specialist like sort of subjects by itself they start to exist, they exist. But I think we are getting, we are living in a time when we see all engineers start to work with electrical civil engineers, with computer science, agriculture, uh, technology. So basically, we are we are not realizing this, but we are changing all aspects of our jobs already as we live. And uh, having inclusive design is one of, the one of the steps from the farming point. And in order to change our steps of the jobs, the only way how we do this is to talk to each other, understanding stakeholders, understanding everyone's requirements. We want to be able to work on the data and give value. Really, very comes from understanding all around and the impact. And having this understanding that we are getting now to the next era of new jobs. Steps and uh, inclusive design is already there. Low compliant AI does not exist, but it will be there. So it's, uh, there is no any other way to move backwards. And uh, inclusive, uh, inclusivity is part of this. So I'm taking a, I guess, a slightly different perspective from a software uh, angle. So and kind of think about the more user interface and the software tools that people end up seeing. So I mentioned an example in Bradford, and where what we're asking the client and ask them, well, first of all, do they have does every single shop do they have a smartphone? 
fortunately they will do it. Now we're also working on a project with the Nagam Iran Water Energy Food Nexus. And that's looking at farming, it's looking at marshlands, it's looking at all these things. People mention those across the world, do they all have smartphones? No. So we've already got our barrier to entry when we're thinking about that. Now that, uh, that applies in our cities, it applies to all the things, and also the connectivity. I mean, I've got family in the southwest of this country, and there's no internet signal in a lot of the places. I'd love there to be. It's just wires, it's said it, yeah. um, but there is um, not people that works anyway, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so how, how do I make that work? How do I get data to, to that? Can you be a website load? What about, we're working with North Wales, well, actually they need to deploy in Welsh. And the amount of space to think about, if I deliver just that says a button, this is star or something, every word in Welsh is a lot longer. <laughs> Um, I don't speak Welsh, so I have no idea how to that it is. But I have to completely think about my, rethink my design. Because things don't fit on the screen in the same way. Um, I'm, I'm very well to speak Greek, and we have a it's different alphabet, different way of thinking. If you have language which is going left to right or right to left, it's a different way of looking at it. What about colorblind? Different way of presenting data. Put data on a map, someone's colorblind, chances are they won't be able to see it. So all those things, and a lot of those apply to almost every single use case when I think about smart cities. And if we don't engage with people in every single, in each of those ways, we're just completely missing the entire swath of our society. Thanks. I'm also going to throw in a couple of different um, angles as well, which I think also contribute to making a more robust, rounded solution. And um, one of them is resilience, and the other one is um, evolution or legacy systems. So resilience is in particular this notion that should something go wrong and the systems break, A, how do they react to that? Is it catastrophically or is there a somewhat graceful degradation? B, how do you recover that? And we had the example earlier with the power systems in particular, where it does what they call it, I think the black start, where everything is shut down and how do you recover? Or I've worked with um, Network Rail on railways, and you know when, when it really gets there's a real real problem with railways, um, and the, the trains are not in place, they have to be how to untangle that and get things going back again. And so it really is important from a systems engineering perspective to consider those less than perfect cases, and not just optimize for the perfect system, but to make sure that you have a means to recover or to work at you know a, a somewhat lesser level while you get it back up to where you would want to be. And that's a key element, a key consideration to have. Other related elements is what I call legacy systems, or if you take, for instance, this whole idea of connected cars, you are going to have a, a long transition period where you have a mix. You have a mix of the old cars and the new cars, and they have to coexist. Uh, similarly, with um, petrol fuel vehicles and electric, and you have to have two different effectively types of infrastructure coexisting in place for a while. And again, those are aspects that need to be taken into consideration. These are real life uh, uh, considerations that you're not just operating in a kind of bubble perfect you know, environment, but you're operating in the real world. And I would just say those are additional considerations to, to really make sure to take into account. Thank Hi, I'm Farah, I'm a PhD student at Westminster, and my question is about data. So you've talked a lot about um, connecting uh, different systems in cities and making them speak to each other, but my question is more about data storage and processing. So in the future, well, how do you think that aspect of data management is going to be thought of in terms of cities? Are we going to think about building our cities differently? How big of a problem is it to store all of this data? And what about the different types of data that we need to store? So, I think to some extent we don't, we don't know. Um, but there's a lot of things we tried out. So, um, in um, New York, there's a trial where they're looking at it as rings. So having basic tiers, there's tiers one to tier four, 
very much built on the idea of each of, of the energy network, um, which has kind of different levels within that. So saying, actually, can we put a mini data center on the edge within every block of flats? Have local storage there that is useful, um, and then put it per block, then move it up to city level, and then move it up to national level. And um, very much how a lot of our national infrastructures work. They work in this tiered federated structure. And can we do the same with data and compute? Because the reality is, do I need to send my data from here to Ireland to store it and then just to view it on a web page? I really don't. I shouldn't have to. But the reality is, I'm in Leeds. There's four data centers in Leeds. Why am I even sending it to far London? Because that takes energy as well. But I probably want to send it back up to London in case it's a failure in that data center. So that's probably most, one of the most common approaches that I'm seeing in happening. Um, but it really, it's a, it's a very much commercial game, I was going to say. And that's probably the biggest challenge, is that everyone wants to own that whole piece, which makes it very hard. Um, so it is a race that you see who builds the right data centers where. And then it's how do you make them compatible with each other? Because can you have your data stored in the US and Azure? And GCP and IBM. So one of the trends there is thinking about multi-cloud type storage, which brings a whole range of other challenges to another day. I would add, uh, it's, it's something actually we were experiencing as well, where you know, there's a big push towards cloudifying, putting the data in the cloud, and the cloud, as you say, it could be Ireland, it could be you know around the world, and the economics and, and the processing and the data and the energy that's in, involved in that. Um, I think fundamentally there's going to start being more recognition and realization of that, that impact that that has and there's a real need to, to think up front of data usage, not necessarily knowing how much data you're going to capture but at least pick up on that native data early on to understand what is the um, what are the attributes of that data how long do you anticipate that that data is going to be stored for, uh, and that you start making some decisions early on and not just kind of stick it all in a big cloud somewhere and then worry about it afterwards. And more and more, I think, organizations are starting to get to that level of maturity, and um, there comes a point where you have to kind of draw a line in the sand and say, well, maybe we've done it this way in somewhat unorganized manner up until now, but going forward, it does need to be more, more structured. I think. So there will be more evolution in that um, across the board. Um, I very much agree with everything that has been said. Uh, but maybe some what I'm seeing already, we have a lot of data collection companies. Data collection companies, some of them collect every second of the data. So we do have collect, and uh, if they collect it for one or two years, suddenly COVID hit and all the nights and all the data collectors is not usable anymore. So basically, uh, we everyone has a phone. Mobile phone. Do you have a phone? Yeah. How many of you have uh, uh, face recognition? So that basically you want to unlock your phone with face. Yeah. Very convenient. Yeah. Uh, how, how, many, how many images of yourself is stored to my plan? Do you store a lot of thousands of your images? So many, I hope no one sees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm thinking about images. I'm thinking about how much of AI needs to have a data to start to recognize your face. Do you remember when you started to make it activate? So you get like turning it around, get up, get the features, but it doesn't save your data. Because we are now working on a small, simple application. You are not saving your data through every single time I look on fingerprint or face because we know it. In the industrial world, we don't know yet the value of the data. We don't know what it will bring value and how. And as soon as we start to understand it, we will start to create very similar applications where you don't need to store and collect all data. Yes, you will need to get some data, but it will be different type, not collection for the purpose of collection. But understanding when you need to do this and where the value comes. It's more value based collection. Okay. Okay. So, 
maybe a question related to this would be uh, how are the security and privacy concerns associated with the use of smart city technologies and how can we go further away from the risks? Because there's a lot of people who use their laptops and they're usually covering the camera. I'm not one of them. <laughs> but uh, because they feel like they're it's like there isn't any privacy and usually whenever we open any random website, they ask us if we want to allow cookies or something like that. And I notice many people not allowing it and then they're not able to actually access the website. So my question would be, yeah, again on privacy. <laughs>
wanted to be working in those markets for a long time and work in data and connectivity for a very long period of time. The problem is now, the minute you're going to start, as you said, start to do all the security, you're not going to do, use anything. Life is becoming very hard as it is. People know your data already. It's been used so many places. I was in a flight coming from London back to the UK, chatting to someone about uh, Rolls Royce engines. And as I planned it, LinkedIn showed me something about the new Rolls Royce engine <laughs> and what they're doing. And it was absolutely my former standoff at the time, because I was in the flight mode. And then when we landed, that happened. So whatever you're trying to do nowadays, it will kind of restrict your life if you start to go super conscious about security. And I've seen people very, very anxious and they're really scared to the point I started to see people walking with the old Nokia phone, the 3210, because they're too scared to use a normal, uh, normal mobile phones anymore. So I think we, we've got to start trusting a bit of the system, and we're going to be, as I said, we're going to have to make sure that we we use the right sites and the right places where we access data, but we cannot live our whole life worrying about this stuff because you cannot sleep at night otherwise. So, yeah, thank you. Is there any more questions? I actually have one more, but it's a bit out of the topic. Uh, it's more about what really inspired you to go into this field, or like where do you see the future heading in this field, or yeah, whatever you want to share. Uh, well, I guess I got into. I went to engineering because I was I was quite lucky to have um, two parents who were engineers then, but they're civil engineers. Uh, but I noticed what they were doing with, with bridges and, and buildings and thought, you know, that's a bit boring because they're just staying still while we're home and work on stuff which moves. Um, and so at university I did a lot of modules on, on mechanical and electrical engineering um, and yeah, got into things which move, which is basically transport. Um, and initially it was, it was kind of purely for the interest in, in transportation and the engineering involved. Um, but I'm really lucky that I've found um, a really big interest in, in a big field at the moment, which is environment and climate change. And, and there are so many exciting challenges in this area. You know, I come across new things every day, I'm learning new things every day. If you're a mechanical engineer, if you're thinking about electric vehicles, there are, there are all sorts of challenges around fire and fire management. Um, which you know just aren't in the British standards. So very much cutting edge of uh, research at the moment. There are all the challenges if you're an electrical engineer about um, energy efficiency and how do, how do we reduce energy? How do we electrify more and more of our systems? Um, if you're a civil engineer, what do you do about infrastructure? How do you use low carbon concretes? How do you build um, you know more efficient structures so you're losing uh, using less material? Um, so you know really exciting area that. Even the audience who are still considering what to do with their career, I really recommend at least you know reading up on being familiar with the environment, if not really trying to pursue the area. There's so many interesting roles at the moment. Companies are scrambling for, for more and more sustainability experts. So yeah, from it's, I find it really interesting, and I'm also lucky to be in a, a sector which is growing really fast as well. Um, yeah, I won't go on to what yeah. is going to happen in the future. Hopefully, good things. Hopefully, we do good things, and it doesn't all end in catastrophe. Um, but yeah, I really like my career. Yeah, I actually like doing a lot of hands-on things when I was a very young age. I actually started my engineering like, career as a master of scientist, um, and then I did master in transport. So the reason I did it is purely I love traveling. Um, that's why I got into this. Um, and then as I as I as I kind of like. Uh, IT as a technology hobby. Um, I think a lot of people are like technology. That's how I got fascinated around um, all the all, all the technology. Um, and then when I started working, I just realized there's actually a lot more engineering than like what what the university offered. From university, not only like electrical, mechanical, civil, but like and you, as you go into the industry, as you mentioned, there's fire engineering. It's fighting engineers, all that's been hype. And now that like when we work on work on a project, we actually interact with a lot of stakeholders. It's very interesting to learn from their point of view 
of how this, how everyone sees things very differently. So, um, yeah, and then uh, as we learn, as we work on different project, we learn a lot of other things. Like, um, I, I think engineers like we tend to be the one that who uh, does not, uh, in terms of like the financial side of things, we are not being taught very well. Um, I think as you do a lot of those projects and you keep growing, yeah, I've been learning a lot, and yeah, definitely um, encourage all of you to like look into all different types of like different fields of engineering. That's so wonderful. Yeah. Um, just a slightly different angle. I'm team academia. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's think about smart cities. Um, I think people are thinking, oh yes, well, we should smart cities and nothing to be on with developing technologies and levels of technologies, I think the future of smart cities will be gradually changing. And it's evolutionary process. It's not something that should still come. And I'm sure that all of you will ask what does mean smart cities. Even people are not speaking about even all that, so we'll look different angle. And once we achieve one angle, we will not be stopping there. We'll be considering the next one. And with new technologies, another chat video will be enabled coming in. Suddenly, all our vision will be completely changed. And I think uh, vision, vision, like what smart city is coming up, is using opportunities of existing enablers, capitalizing what we have, and bringing our the world to be better. And come together with solution, it will get our goals. And it's not even like goals, it's important to understand the village where I get to know to a completely different level. And uh, it will see smart cities as a progression rather than just a final goal. I think we will see and bring far more than what they are already doing. I think with new developments, there are new challenges, so things that we might be able to do more. You see, you always yeah. start to think about new challenges. Yeah. 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 And this will make some news about. So, for me, one of the things I find fascinating as a software engineer and engineering practice, I think we're definitely a, a close to species of engineers where we are willing to work really hard in order to be lazy. Um, I mean, one of the more great use cases for the internet was the person who had to up their chair to make coffee. I mean, you know, so as a software engineer, and Mark, the key thing about doing me around digital twins was, I didn't like to have the office to go and count cars and do all the field work. So I figured I'd build models and simulations to do that. Um, so I was willing to put in very long hours, stupid long hours, years of effort in models, maths, software engineering, so that I didn't have to go out with some theory would only take me two weeks. So there's something slightly wrong there, but that has been, that's engineering for you. And it's all about that efficiency and optimization. And people seeing the fact that their colleagues who are making mistakes, because as an analogy I give, so when we were building, we were uh, simulating data centers. And when we entered any thermodynamic project data centers, you would need a thermodynamic engineer, you needed a software engineer for how data centers are scheduled and runs, and then you needed a simulation engineer to figure out simulate the thing. And all three would have had a PhD level and probably a team of each. And I don't get not anyone who has three PhDs across those three subjects. So how do you automate some of those so you can actually enable people to do that and tackle the problems that are really interesting? Um, and also, I don't want to learn how to count cars. I think um, we're going to say about making the world better, and that sounds correct, but what it is, and I think also we want to do that to know where, to my mind, engineering lets you come up with something that is in the end, it's tangible and real, and that you can point to and say, this, this happened, um, this works. And there's also an element of team building, uh, team working, because building is not one lone, you know, brilliant person working in the corner that's going to make it happen. It's about putting several heads together, several perspectives, and making it work. Um, a final part, I think, is around, it's, it brings into play the wider parts of society as well, because Real challenge in engineering actually is is that you have a particular you know task or remit, but there are 
budget considerations, there are timing considerations, there are resource considerations, and it's how you pull all those together to come up with something. And oftentimes, having those constraints is what brings out the best and brings out the creativity and, and the different opportunities. And I think it's the challenge of that that really makes it exciting. I would say as well, and I'm listening to everyone talking, we're all kind of establishing our careers and involved in, and I think we're all, I listen to everybody else about really interesting projects. And we're, we're enjoying it, I think we're all happy, enjoying what we do. It's, I think back to, you know, in university and some of the courses did feel fairly abstract and dry and theoretical, and okay, you had the occasional project in lab that maybe made it a bit more tangible, but it all, it all felt a bit distant. Um, but in a way that, that, you know, it sets you up with the, the, back, the knowledge and the, the understanding and the mechanisms, the tools that you then use further on in your career to then apply to these very real, practical, uh, tangible projects that, that ultimately hopefully benefit society and benefit yourselves and, and wider, wider, um, the wider world. So I think that's what um, is, is of interest. That's what, uh, could I have articulated it like that when I went to this year? No, but um, it's, it's how it's worked out and uh, we're pleased with that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for uh, this wonderful discussion <laughs> and uh, for the talks. They, they were quite interesting. I uh, learned a lot, uh, especially when collecting data should be outside. <laughs> <laughs> that I will never forget. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you very much. And I think we can give a quick thought. No. And then I would like to invite no, uh, Dr. Navam and Dr. Mona and Dr. Saima for a uh, certain appreciation for our panelists, giving them some specific.